I guess the lights are on, that means I can start. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome to what is going to be a very busy afternoon. We've got a lot to get through, so without further ado, I shall introduce Lara Spreckman, CEO of Nobel Prize Outreach, to just say a few warm words of hello. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam. And uh, thank you all. Welcome to this Nobel Prize Dialogue Singapore. Dear Excellencies, dear Nobel Prize laureates, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, it's such a pleasure to be here. And uh, I will be very, very brief. So we have lots of ground to cover this afternoon. I look much forward to it to discuss about the future we want, the, the future we can shape, and the future that hopefully looks bright for us all, for ourselves, for our planet, and for the next generation. With us, we have students from the Asia-Pacific region and wonderful speakers to look into very different topics within this well-being that brings it all together. So without further ado, I would just like to thank our speakers, of course, and then our Nobel International Partners, ABB, 3M, Capgemini, and Scania for our, your support. I would like to thank NUS for this wonderful co collaboration and my dear colleagues. I would like now to introduce Professor Yap Seng Chong, the Dean of the School of Medicine at NUS. Thank you again. Enjoy this session. Welcome. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Young, young people have the greatest stake in how global challenges are being responded to because it shapes their future. However, a recent report from the Walton Family Foundation highlighted that the 1.8 billion young people in the world have low expectations that the governments, corporations and other institutions will prioritise them or take their needs into consideration. We talk about the importance of uh, giving the youth opportunities to speak about the future, but it's equally, if not more, important that we listen. We need to listen in order to understand what their fears, hopes, dreams and priorities are. And we need to hear so that we know how to tangibly lend our support to bring to life their vision for the future. The same report states that young people care most deeply about the health and happiness of their friends and family, as well as their own health and happiness. Very aptly, the discussions this afternoon will centre around this topic of well-being and kickstart our collective journey towards improving the wellness of our youths uh, and their futures. So I look forward to the lively conversations that I'm sure will follow this afternoon. Thank you. And now I ask um, Tiki to come up to give his thoughts about what we're going to do this afternoon. Um, thank you very much. Um, I just have three slides to share with you. I'll be very brief. If I could have that first slide, please. Well, I did give the slide. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Last Saturday was the Mid-Autumn Festival. It is usually celebrated with mooncakes. You may ask, why mooncakes? Why the moon? In Chinese mythology, Princess Chang'e lived on the moon with her white jade rabbit. Now, let me tell you a personal story. I'm trying to move the next slide. On 20th of August, nine, sorry, 20th of July, 1969, I watched the moon landing with my late grandmother in front of a black and white TV in our home in Jakarta, Indonesia. After 
Neil Armstrong stepped foot on the moon, I looked at my grandma and I said, Grandma, look, you can see. There's no princess. There's no white rabbit on the moon. So you can stop celebrating the mid-autumn festival from now on. Grandma smiled, looked at me, and this is what she said. How do you know we are looking at the same moon? I still remember to this day, moral of the story is clear. We all see different things. We do not all have the same view of the world. And basically, when I think of my own children, it's very clear to me that their view of the world is very different to the view of the people in my generation. So in the context of the future we want together, we decided that young people should be at the heart of the dialogue that we are having today. And we are very fortunate that there are so many amazing young people from many countries in the region who are with us today, who have helped shape the heart of the dialogue. So I'm just going to finish with a quotation from Nelson Mandela. To the youth of today, I also have a wish to make. Be the script writers of your destiny and feature yourselves as stars that show the way towards a brighter future. So really looking forward to uh, this afternoon and hearing from all of you uh, young people. Thank you. So I pass it now to Adam, who is going to actually tell you how we have involve all of you in, in, in shaping the heart of the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, you don't. You're okay. I need that, but, oh, Tiki, thank you very much indeed for that introduction. <laughs> so, as you know, I'm Adam Smith, um, uh, Chief Scientific Officer from Nobel Prize Outreach, and it's been my huge pleasure to work very closely with Tiki for the last two years, putting together this program, curating it. And Tiki has given you the poetic introduction to our dialogue. I'll give you the prosaic introduction, which is kind of the nuts and bolts. We decided to break this topic of the future we want together into six areas of well-being. And those are the six themes that we'll be covering during the course of the afternoon. And as Tiki says, we were very, very keen to involve the youth of the Asia-Pacific region in this discussion. And in doing that, we were aided by the um, Asian Medical Students Association based here at NUS, who reached out to the Asia-Pacific region and asked for volunteers for people who would like to join the discussion. And it was a very complicated and elaborate process, and I'm incredibly grateful to, we are incredibly grateful to them for all the work they put into it. And they selected a wonderful group of young people who then took part in discussions before today with Nobel laureates in these six areas. So in each of the areas, there was a pre-discussion recorded, a one and a half hour pre-discussion between around about 12 young people and a Nobel laureate. And those pre-discussions are filmed and they will be available as from tomorrow, uh, the 14th of September, on nobelprize.org, the website for the Nobel Prize, and you can watch them in full. So if you want to watch nine hours of content of young people and Nobel laureates in discussion, they'll be available. Today we're just going to see some clips of those discussions, highlights, and those highlights will help drive the discussions that we're having this afternoon. Our Nobel Prize dialogues are mostly about conversations, and those conversations will in part be uh, led by some of the comments that especially the young people made during these pre-discussions. So that's the setup. This afternoon is, as I've mentioned, a very busy afternoon. And then this evening, there's a further session in which some of the key findings, the key takeaways from this afternoon's discussion will be further discussed. So uh, I think that sums it up. As you will have seen from the program, we're starting with the theme of digital well-being. And um, 
the, each of our mini sessions will take pretty much the same format. There'll be some kind of video introduction followed by a longer panel discussion. For digital well-being, we actually have two introductions. The first is from a venture capitalist based in California who invests very heavily in the digital sector. He's called Bill Tai, and he gave a very thoughtful um, uh, kind of encapsulation of what he thinks about the future of the digital world is going to be. Um, and it actually serves as a very good introduction to all the themes we're going to be discussing this afternoon, so it's a perfect place to start. So please, can we roll the video from Bill Tai? I'm Bill Tai. I'm a venture capitalist based in Silicon Valley. I've been funding startups since 1991, so a good uh, 30 plus years of riding every wave there is in technology. I think the joint digital future for all of mankind is the ability to be anywhere, any place, and be connected with anyone else you want to be connected to, to have uh, sort of uh, mutual productivity uh, that is inspiration-based. I do think, though, that uh, given that we've got a world of around 7 or 8 billion people, around 2 to 3 billion of those in advanced economies, pretty well connected, that we have to do a great job building out broadband and a technology base to bring the other 5 billion people online pretty quick. Bringing the rest of the world up to speed is not going to be an easy task. That said, the rate of change in technology is is turning the uh, equation to the positive, you can now drop a solar panel and a satellite link on any school in any continent, such as Africa, and connect up swaths of the population at price points of a few thousand dollars. That was not possible 10 years ago. The biggest concern I have going forward about the digitization of the world is the structural implications on society we already are faced with a lot of wealth inequality. Wealth inequality is based on knowledge and increasingly on digital access. If the advanced societies do not do what it takes to bring up the rest of the world at an accelerated pace, that gap is going to get bigger. So I think now that technology is at a point where you don't have to build out fiber optic cables to every home in every continent, but you can drop a solar panel and a satellite dish onto clusters of population like schools, there's a way to basically accelerate the bringing up of the underdeveloped economies to try to add them to the productive world at a faster pace. And I think it's incumbent upon governments and all of us to try to push for that to happen sooner rather than later. Technology has always been a double-edged sword and it can accelerate things to, uh, a scale that has been previously unimaginable. When I work on companies that do end up working out, for me, it's a very simple formula. You find a use case, make it replicable, make it scalable. And so if you can lower friction to something, make it replicable and scalable, it can spread really fast. Zoom is a perfect example of that. The downside of that scaling is that things can happen at scale without you knowing it and can have potentially very destructive uh, uh, elements that, uh, that encumber everything from our environment to people's mental health. And you, you've seen that happening already in, of course, you know, kind of the data issues around privacy and companies like Facebook. So I think uh, we as a community and with a little bit of uh, you know, government support, need to intervene to make sure that we steer that double-edged sword to the positive side because the implications of letting things run in total sort of you know free market means could be so destructive that you can't get your arms around it before it's too late it has been the case that in prior generations of technology um, the purveyors of those technologies um, got to a point where they realized that things that they were doing were having destructive elements um, and negative implications on society. Uh, I think that happened in the Industrial Revolution to some extent. It took a little while. It's happened a little bit in the biotech industry. The, uh, the digital industry is a little bit of a conundrum, to use a uh, Alan Greenspan word, because 
everyone's connected, things happen really fast, but in a way they don't communicate deeply. They communicate at sort of a superficial tactical level uh, responding to the increased noise around them. Um, something has to be done to get the leaders in the digital world to communicate in a way that is not superficial to try to help define policy that can uh, keep things on the right track. Uh, it's not an easy problem to solve because the capital markets reward those who just hustle and drive their businesses as opposed to, tactically that is, as opposed to long-term. But I think we need some sort of a system to, uh, uh, and the social context of leadership to, to get people to think about the long-term implications a little bit more when they're building these products out. The discussion that you are about to undertake is critically important. If you think about the state of the world today, obviously we've got a lot of wonderful things happening, but we also have a lot of big problems. One of the big, big problems is what we do as a world for our whole economy. We have a GDP of this planet of around 70 trillion. We have about 270 trillion of debt. Those numbers might be undercounted. The GDP is growing at 3% a year. The debt grows 10% a year like clockwork. Those lines are never going to intersect. So one of the things that you have to think about is how do we fix that problem? You've got advanced economies, 2 billion, 3 billion people, developing economies, four, five, six billion. I actually don't know the actual number. I think one of the only ways to fix the systemic issue we have with our capital markets is to get those other four or five, six billion people productive pretty quickly. If you can come up with ways to onboard that mass, get them economically productive, we as a planet may have an ability to both outgrow that debt load have policies in place where the people that are coming on board are a little bit more aware of the environmental and climate consequences of things that they're working on. Because without that education and without that onboarding, you have economies where people are in survivalist mode and they're willing, un unknowingly willing to just destroy everything around them to live. So I think it's incumbent upon you to think about these basic issues. How do we get those people on board? How do we set up a system to educate them well? What are the guardrails that you put in place? How do you connect them to the developed economies to make everything function well? That is the challenge of our generation. So thank you to Bill Tai, and he has indeed set a challenge. Um, I would like, before our next presentation, to welcome our first panel on stage. So if I could have joining me here, Ruben Ng, Sergio Roche, Axel Shafiq, Wharton Chan, please. So do you want to go there? Or sit here? Axel there, yes, thank you. Wharton there, and Ruben, why don't you come over here? <laughs> Some choreography. And joining us online, we have Stuart Russell. So Ruben Ng is um, a professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy here in Singapore. Serge Roche, 2012 Nobel Laureate in Physics. Axel Shafiq, a post postgraduate student in public health from uh, Pakistan, Wharton Chan, a MD PhD student at the Duke NUS Medical School, and joining us virtually, uh, Stuart Russell, who is a professor in computer science at Berkeley. Uh, welcome to you all. <laughs> and AXA and Wharton were um, young student participants in our earlier discussions with Serge Arosh on this theme of digital well-being. Now, before we begin the panel, I would like to invite Stuart to give a talk in, entitled, What Next? And after that. Oh, hang on, Stuart. No. We good? 
We're good. Okay. Uh, thanks, Adam. So Adam has kindly given me five minutes to cover uh, the state of the art and the future of artificial intelligence and our digital world. Um, so I'll try to do that. Um, let me begin uh, by giving you a brief tour of some of the things that have been happening recently in AI. Um, many of you will know that uh, back in 2016 and 17, uh, AlphaGo defeated the best human Go players, something that was thought to take another 100 years uh, just a few years ago. We also have AI systems that are successfully detecting North Korea's underground nuclear tests. We have self-driving cars. It's been taken uh, 35 years uh, to get there, but they're finally becoming a reality. Um, we also have amazing systems that can take uh, a prompt given in words, for example, teddy bears mixing sparkling chemicals as mad scientists in a steampunk style, uh, and then actually producing that image entirely from scratch. Um, so it, this is almost magical, and you can play with these systems yourself uh, out there um, for free. We also have some, some uh, as you would expect, some misuses, some online harms uh, that are threatening our digital well-being. Uh, so one of those is, is using the same kind of image synthesis to create uh, fake human beings. These are four people, none of whom actually exist in the real world. Um, and we can now simulate real people so well that uh, even political experts are unable to detect that they're talking to a fake mayor of Kyiv, Vitaly Klitschko. Uh, and of course, we're now starting to use AI systems to kill people, uh, which, I, as I will explain in a minute, is a really bad idea. So let's talk about what's coming next. Well, one way to figure that out is to extrapolate from the kinds of visible advances that I just described, the sorts of advances that we see in the newspapers that are hailed as breakthroughs. And it's easy to, to, uh, to predict that uh, as self-driving cars become um, more uh, successful, more accurate, safer, um, they will lead to a period, at least in, in most of the major cities, of cheap and ubiquitous personal transportation, uh, possibly 20 to 30 times cheaper than a taxi, for example. Uh, in medicine, we might have improved ability to diagnose disease, uh, from, uh, from x-rays or from MRIs. Uh, we could imagine extrapolating from image synthesis to video synthesis uh, and be able to produce uh, your own films uh, simply by narrating what you want to have happen uh, and then giving some directorial guidance to the AI system uh, as it produces the movie. And of course, if we scale up those, uh, those lethal autonomous weapons into massive swarms, uh, then we may also see genocide uh, on a nuclear scale. So those are some of the things that are visible, but what's visible now is what was just stating decades ago uh, in the research labs uh, in those ivory towers around the world. Um, so if we want to predict the future, we have to ask what's just stating now, not what's visible now. And I think what's just stating now is really a set of ideas for producing general purpose AI. So what is general purpose AI? So I contrast that with uh, AI for specific purposes of the kind that I just listed. General purpose AI would be capable of quickly learning to do any of those things and many other things. In fact, anything human beings can do, general purpose AI would be able to do uh, and very quickly exceed human capabilities in all areas. And this is the long-term goal of the field. So we have to ask then, what happens if the field of AI succeeds in its long-term goal? Where does that uh, lead to? And what kind of world will we live in? Well, to look on the bright side, and actually to pick up on a point that the Bill Tai made, one thing we could do with general purpose AI, because it can do everything that human beings could do, it can deliver uh, the kind of life that we already know how to deliver to people in the advanced economies, we could deliver that to everyone on Earth because the AI systems can do it at almost no cost. 
And so if we look at what that means, raising the living standards of everyone to a respectable uh, level comparable to the advanced economies, that will be about a tenfold increase in the GDP of the world. Uh, and what economists call the net present value, which is sort of the cash equivalent uh, of that increase in, in income, would be about $13.5 quadrillion. So that's a lower bound, a low ball estimate of the value of creating general purpose AI. We might also be able to go way beyond just uh, delivering the same standards of living to everybody. We could have advances that would make a much better civilization. We could have healthcare that's really optimized for every individual. We could have education that teaches every child in a way that's superior even to expert human tutors. And human tutors can bring uh, a smart child to the level of a college education uh, by the age of 10. And so it would dramatically change the way our entire education system works. And we could do that for everyone on Earth. We could also improve the rate of scientific discovery. Uh, and this is already starting to happen in many areas. So that's looking on the bright side. But many people are also wondering, well, if we are going to hand over the management of our civilization to machines, as happens in this image drawn from the Wall-E movie, uh, then that leaves human beings not just unemployed, but actually completely enfeebled because we lose the incentive to learn uh, and we lose capabilities to do more, almost anything uh, for ourselves. And that's why in Wall-E, uh, the adults are all depicted uh, wearing baby clothes. Let me put one more point out there for discussion. This is Alan Turing, um, who in 1936 wrote the paper that founded the entire field of computer science. Without Alan Turing, there would be no digital future to be discussed. And when he was asked what happens if we succeed, he said this, it seems probable that once the machine thinking method had started, it would not take long to outstrip our feeble powers. At some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. So with that, I will hand it back to the panel. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Stuart. Um, in what you and Bill Tai together have said, there is enough to fill the whole afternoon, and we recognize that. So we can only touch on a few things during this discussion. And the idea of these discussions is for people to be in conversation and to seed a few ideas, make the audience think about a few things. We can't hope to solve anything in this time, I'm afraid. If I was, Serge, I'd like to come to you in a second because you were you listen to these views of all the young people for these 90 minutes, and I'd like to um, have your take on what has been said so far and also what, how that relates to what the young were saying. But first, I'd like to play yet one more video, and this was touching on your point, Stuart, about people worrying about the potential of AI to replace humanity. And in the student discussions, this came out quite strongly, and these three clips, these, or this one clip of three people speaking, I think illustrates that. I think uh, healthcare is expensive. So using technology will help us to reduce the cost and that would improve the financial well-being of the patients. And there's always limited human resources in the healthcare sector. So using technology may reduce the burdens on the doctor and nurses. So that would improve the well-being of the healthcare professional. These are all good. But however, like this is my second part of the question is like in the future, do you think Dr. Anaxis may lose their job as the AI is replacing them in diagnosis and like giving prescription? I feel strongly that um, clinical medicine can never be replaced by AI because the doctor patient relationship is in essential in achieving a diagnosis. If you want to diagnose uh, a lesion, for example, you need to do the neurological exam where you have to actually touch the patient and you see for the signs. So that's why I feel like doctors will never be replaced, but AI can supplement what we currently have and make things better. One more point why AI will never replace is 
replace the doctors is the communication between doctor and patient like humans have empathy and i don't and a good communication between doctor and patient will also improve the adherence to treatment plans that benefits long-term health thank you very much indeed so and anna in that last part of the clip was there raising the the word empathy so important serge would you like to comment first of all on this uh, question <coughs> First of all, I would like to say that I was very uh, pleased to have this discussion with young students in this uh, pre-recorded uh, video uh, because I think my generation and theirs has, been, has seen this development of dig the digital world in quite different ways. I spent most of my life in a pre-digital area at time and uh, I see uh, the danger and the advantage of this from, um, I would say, from outside. The young generation has been immersed in this from the beginning, and I saw that maybe you would have different views about that. And what I found very positive is that our views were very close to, to one another, that we all, we both, the young people and the older generation, both think that uh, uh, you have advantages of, in this digital world, in artificial intelligence that we should take advantage of, but there are also dangers. Dangers uh, because we are facing a world which is not human. We can be led to confuse humanity with artifi the artificial world, and it has some very uh, dangerous aspects. And I was really pleased and uh, relieved to see that the young generation is seeing this kind of danger as appeared in these video clips and we shared a lot of issues. Uh, I think it's very important to balance the advantages, the fantastic new possibilities that are given by uh, this, uh, this new technology and also be careful about the dangers, about the fact that we can enter into a world which will uh, get out of control and this is that was the topic of our discussions. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you very much indeed. I don't know, Wharton, did you want to come in on this point? Um, yes, I, 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 there was, there's one consistent theme about digital future, is that it is a double-edged sword. Mm. So the question therefore remains as to how we make this sword towards our benefit and not be hurt by the sword. And one of the things I feel very strongly is that technological development must proceed at a pace that is matching humanity itself. If without the ethical frameworks, without um, knowledge and um, education in uh, different parts of the world uh, that does not match how the digital realm is proceeding, then we will have this mismatch where we can see things like misinformation or cyber crime that uh, would otherwise be overshadowing the benefits of what technology brings to us. Thank you very much. Axel, I'll come to you in a second. But I don't, Stuart, you work in computer science with this all the time. Technology is moving much faster than regulation can possibly keep up with it, is it not? Yeah, I, I think the idea that we could slow down the development of technology, particularly when people have their eyes on that 13.5 quadrillion dollar prize, uh, I think that's probably unrealistic. Um, there may be certain areas where we could put a stop to deployment altogether. Um, and for example, in the European Union, uh, it should soon be illegal uh, to have a simulation of a real human um, where, uh, where that, uh, the fact that it's a simulation is not announced uh, to the viewer. So an, uh, an autonomous AI system that's pretending to be human always has to say, I'm not human, I'm actually just a digital fiction. Um, and I think that's an important step that I would like to see replicated around the world. But overall, pushing forward on AI capabilities is going to happen at the maximum rate that you know the hundreds of thousands of people working on it can push it. 
Uh, so we really have to move ahead with the regulation and figuring out how, uh, as Wharton said, uh, to point the sword away from us and not towards us, um, uh, so that our AI systems remain under control and we, that we regulate the design and deployment of those systems to make sure that they're actually beneficial. Thank you. Axa, did you want to comment? Um, I would like to, first of all, thank you all for being here and being interested in the fact that digital well-being needs some attention. Secondly, I would like to state the fact that we are here because uh, we are digitalizing, but we, did, we have to realize it's for us we created AI. It's not for AI we were created. So every book, every um, thing that we do in medical, non-medical, in other sciences has an instruction manual. But does digital life, how to use digital life, or how to digitalize itself has an instruction manual? Or do we have certain guidelines that help us develop ourselves and digitalize at a pace that helps us be on an equal speed? So that is a thing that we need to focus on as humans uh, who are going to be developing ourselves, our lives in digital world. And I would like to put this as a question in our minds to work on maybe. Thank you. Serge? Uh, yes, I, I think that the question of regulation is very important. Artificial intelligence is used and data uh, storing is used by uh, the social media uh, to uh, build up the algorithms which are being processed and which are being used in the systems. And these algorithms are not neutral. Uh, they push us to consume certain products and not others to get interested in some topics and not others, to be inter entertained in some ways and not others. And these algorithms are different in different parts of the world. I, I, I learned, for example, that one of the big uh, social media has different algorithms to be used either with European uh, teenagers or uh, Asian Chinese teenagers. And this is not neutral. This is, this is a process by which uh, big populations can be manipulated for all kinds of reasons, economical or political reasons. And I think one step which should be taken is to publish, to have these companies uh, being obliged to uh, have the algorithms as an open source. I understand that an algorithm is something which is difficult to evaluate by a layman, but if the algorithms were published, then some experts could be able to analyze them and to explain to the general public what is in the algorithm, the way they are manipulated. So I don't, maybe it's wishful thinking or a bit naive, but I think there should be regulation putting much more transparency in the way these social network are working. Thank you. So Ruben, you work both on rolling out AI in social care with the elderly and also on trying to get policy to keep pace with AI. So would you like to comment? Sure. Um, th thank you so much, uh, Adam. Um, so you, you, you have a microphone? Yeah. You? Should be on. Well, uh, technology is great and so far as it works. <laughs> I, I hope it works. Yeah, so I, I help governments and organizations implement AI, so I come from a slightly different vantage point. My observations when helping organizations uh, you know, implement AI, sometimes I think the issue of bias does come up, right? Algorithms are biased, and, and my observation is that sometimes algorithms are biased because the teams are not very diverse. The teams creating those AI algorithms are not very diverse. So I think one of the considerations is to really have a diverse team rather than a team coming from a certain demographic uh, group or a certain ethnic group, for example. So, so that's the first point. The, the second thing is that sometimes uh, when uh, organizations want to implement or governments want to implement AI, I, I remember I was, I was asked by uh, a government in Central Asia uh, to try to understand uh, how do we put in AI uh, digital frameworks and digitization for the mining industry, right? So at that time, um, I, I, I was quite clear that it was mining rare metals on Earth, not mining asteroids in space, right? So, so when I went there, you know, they, they said they haven't been able to do this for a decade, right? They haven't been able to digitize the mining industry. 
So, so they presented it as really a digital problem or, or try, trying to put in AI and things like that. But when I went there, I realized why it was so difficult. And the reason was because of corruption. If you digitize everything, everything becomes transparent. It is really difficult to be corrupt anymore. So what I'm trying to say is that sometimes it, when we try to implement AI, we can't just look at what we call the science of AI. We need to look at the art of AI as well. And the art of AI includes implementation, includes changing the processes, includes looking at what's underneath that iceberg. Because at, you know, at the surface, it may be just about AI, about digitization, the science of AI. But I think when it comes to uh, implementation, the art matters a lot more, right? So had we just focused on just looking at AI digitization, the mining industry wouldn't have advanced. We just needed to look at uh, decreasing corruption, changing the culture. Only then can we accelerate the implementation of AI in organizations and governments. Thank you very much. Stuart, can I just, before we show another video clip from the students, can I just get you to comment on that holistic view of AI implementation? Yeah, I think this is an, an extremely good point. If you, if you think about civil engineering, right, the civil engineers, they can cover the entire planet with concrete and asphalt and, and bridges if you ask them to. Um, and there's a whole separate discipline called urban planning or various other names. Um, who figure out, well, what would happen if we put a bridge here? Or what would happen if we put a, uh, a freeway in that place, or as opposed to another place? Or do we need a bridge at all? So they think about what happens when a particular civil engineering artifact is embedded in a context of a particular society. Um, and that discipline doesn't exist for AI, right? There is no companion discipline that studies what happens when you implement an AI system and put it into a hospital or into a school or uh, into an entire society has happened with social media. And what's happening with social media, as, as Serge mentioned, is, is really a catastrophe that could have been predicted by that companion discipline because they would have realized that if you basically, if you connect a reinforcement learning algorithm to human minds, right, the, the way the algorithm works is precisely by changing the state of that human mind, by manipulating it to produce more clicks in future. Uh, and so that's what the algorithms did. They manipulated people on a, on a global scale. Uh, and, and that was a, an utter failure of oversight and of understanding that it's not just about the algorithm, it's about the society you're putting it into. That, thank you very much indeed. And that actually leads perfectly into um, the next clip, which is just as some students talking about misinformation and the need for regulation, please. Uh, I am a medical student from Singapore. There's a lot of manipulation and misinformation that can go on in the digital sphere. But at the same time, I think right now, uh, which is relevant to everyone, I think there's also been sort of a war on how on the democratic um, internet. So across many different countries, there's been uh, increasing regulation of the internet. So for example, there's the Great Firewall in China. Um, you know, there's also been like internet shutdowns in countries like India, for example. A at the same time, um, there's always been sort of like an aspiration to make the internet as democratic as possible. So for example, you mentioned Twitter, right? Which started off as sort of a very unregulated platform, which allowed for the sharing of a lot of information, for example, during the Arab Spring. So I was wondering, um, what do you think about how regulated the internet should be and whether we should be aiming to promote a more by an increasingly open sort of access to internet? Yeah. Hello, I am Amani. I am a medical student from Australia as well. And my comment was trailing from Zhang's um, comment. So when he said, should the internet be more regulated? I thought, who should be responsible in regulating the internet? So how do we actually want the platform to be? I guess that's the question I'm trying to get at. So Serge, that question was asked of you, a non-social media user. <laughs> I guess everybody else on this panel is a social media user. So that it's, it's fair game for anybody. Who should be controlling the way that social media is regulated. I, th <coughs> I think ideally uh, the people who use the social media should exercise their own uh, judgment 
And if they don't like what they see or hear on social media, they just should stop looking or listening to it. Now, who should really regulate? First of all, at the, there is a level at which the company itself should regulate and should make sure that uh, hatred uh, could, not, could not propagate on the social media. So they should be held responsible for what is being said on, on these media. And at a higher level, of course, uh, justice in each country should be able also to intervene uh, at, at a different level. So it's clear that ideally, even with the existing laws, there should be ways to control that. Uh, maybe the, these laws should be enforced more strongly. Maybe what, when, what, what I find really uh, bad is the fact that uh, you can say everything you wish on social media in an anonymous way, so you are not responsible for what you are saying. I, th I, think, I think that at some level, uh, you should not be anonymous on these media. You should be responsible for what you say. You should sign, as you, you sign a book, or you should sign what you are saying and be responsible, be held responsible for that. I don't know at which level that should be introduced, whether it should be in law or in regulation uh, to the social media companies directly, but some lifting of anonymity would be uh, helpful. And I think uh, this uh, would solve some, some of the problem. The bullying or the harassment which we see on the social media is largely due to the fact that it is done freely because people are not, are not held responsible. And I think this is particularly dangerous uh, in the social media in which young people exchange information because they are, they are not responsible for what they say and they don't learn the fact that it's important in life to be responsible. So they do harm without even knowing it very often and this has very terrible consequences on the psychological wel welfare of young people who have seen tragic examples of that, which would have been avoided if uh, some steps had been taken to uh, make uh, the people more responsible uh, about what they say or propagate on, on these media. Thank you. Uh, um, Axa and Wharton, can I just ask if, that, if what Serge says resonates with you? Does that all make sense? Um, it sure does, because I guess we talked about uh, social accountability in a yes. recorded mm -hmm. session as well. And it's not just a topic, it's more like a dilemma now. Mm. And social accountability is not just for people who are engineers or doctors or who are in the fields working with other human people, human beings. It's about uh, opening up avenues in the digital world where when we go in the past, maybe in search time, uh, there were just journalists putting up their ideas. There were just people writing books and people reading them, taking out the views. Now it's 22 million people, 30 million people from different countries, 10 million people. And everyone has their own opinion. Everyone has their own suggestion. And it can be positive, it can be negative. I feel we need to find that balance between what should be said, how it should be said. And this brings us towards the ethical dilemmas that make us be socially accountable. Serge, do you want to? Yeah, yes, I would like to make a remark. I think it's very important if you put some rules forward uh, to be sure that they will not be used for censorship, that they will not be taken advantage of by governments, for instance, to pretend that they are uh, bettering the system and in fact trying to control it. So it's, it's why it's a very tricky business to make sure that you, we keep living in a free society where free thought can be expressed, but at the same time that the excesses of, uh, uh, that we were mentioning uh, could not propagate uh, freely. What, please? Sure. Um, I, I think governments have an important role to play in regulating AI. Um, and my thought really is when it comes to regulating AI, we need to band together as different blocks, you know, as the Association of Southeast Asian countries, ASEAN, for example, EU. Um, I think if we, if we think about regulatory uh, in blocks like this, 
I think it's more advantageous than individual countries thinking about it. So I think that's one. The other thing is that when I work as a data scientist across different organizations, you know, there are points in time where my boss asked me to do something unethical. And I'm really on the cusp of doing something unethical, right? But um, there is no one I can turn to. Sometimes within organizations, we have this ombuds person or something like that, but it's still within the organization. I, I wish there's a global whistleblowing platform yeah. where if I'm an AI professional, AI engineer, a data scientist, if I sense that, or if I am asked to do something unethical, I can go to this global body. So I, I can get some sort of support, some sort of help, um, so that overall, um, AI becomes more ethical. Um, engineers or data scientists like myself have a place to go to and we learn about ethics and we can report about stuff before it's too late. Mm. Hmm. Interesting thought. Um, Stuart, do you want to comment on that briefly before we move on to the next? Uh, I just want to make one point about, uh, about disinformation. It's, it's a wicked problem because it's an online harm that is not perceived by the victim. The victim who's been turned into a neo-fascist by disinformation doesn't say, oh my goodness, I'm a neo-fascist, I'm going to sue Facebook. Right? Um, whatever they've been turned into, they're happy being that because otherwise they wouldn't be that. Um, and so it's actually quite difficult to figure out even a legal framework uh, or how, how you talk about these, these kinds of online harms. Um, but to come back to a point that Serge made, I think there is progress um, in the social media platforms providing access to researchers uh, to both the data and the algorithms. Um, and as far as I can see, they would like to make things better uh, as long as they continue to make as much money. Thank you. Um, we have very, very little time left, but there was one important other aspect of digital well-being that was very much talked about, which is the effect on children. And uh, could we roll the clip, please? Firstly, on the... Uh, the topic of you know overuse of technology in children because that's something that I'm quite passionate about and I also did some work in. So I think uh, it's been increasingly recognized as a public health issue, the, how screen addiction affects children's developments uh, like socially, even cognitively, for example, like language delay, etc. When I was in the pediatrics posting around the hospitals, we see impatient children running around and then we will witness their parents giving them phones to, to live with peace, you know. So, and also besides that, when, when also in the, in the cafeteria, our hospital cafeteria, we also witnessed this similar situation. It's hard. Um, in primary school, they make iPads mandatory and all. So what, what is your opinion on introducing technology to children? Okay, so <laughs> I'm gonna, we've got only a couple of minutes. So I'm going to, Serge, comment from you and then Wharton, please. Yes, I think it's a very important point of our discussion. Uh, in early childhood, babies and early ch children are building their personality, are building their relation to the outside world, are building their connection with objects and with other human beings, building their possibility of uh, manifesting empathy, for instance. And if you expose them too early to the virtual world and too much to, not to social media, but even to a, a flux of images and movies and things or games they can find on the internet. I am afraid that their build, the building of their personality, their training to the world will be altered in a way which is difficult to judge because it's very recent. I have been said, uh, I don't know if it's true, that the CEOs of the big media companies, Google, or, uh, Apple or others are preventing their children to look at the screen. So I think they know what they are talking about. And uh, I think it's very important to control the access of uh, young uh, children to the internet because education, training, building up of personality, access to the world is something which has to be uh, made facing the real world and not the virtual world of images. And, my, my strong belief is that this kind of parental control is very important. And it goes both ways. Parents should t take care of the children, not to consider that the social, social media or the internet is a kind of babysitter, 
but at the same time, they should not be themselves all the time on social media and be able to talk and interact with their children in the real world. So I think it's an important issue. It's an important issue, but as a parent, I can say it's a difficult, it's a difficult yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At different what? levels. <laughs> what? What? Yes, indeed. So, uh, uh, Ruben, you talked about government. Serge, you talked about private companies. I'll talk a bit about the end user, because I feel that part of this revolution is being knowing how to use all these technologies. And part of digital literacy is not just knowing how to use these technologies, but knowing the harms of these technologies and how these apps, for example, you talked about open source. Um, a lot of these social media apps are designed to feed on our dopamine circuit circuits to create addiction so that we can retain, uh, in, in a way, use this, the, have increased screen time uh, continuously so that they have better ad revenue in a sense. So this kind of insight is important in the education part of knowing how to use these technologies and knowing how to stop. So that on all three layers, the government is working on something. Um, companies need to be more aware of the frameworks that you mentioned, but also as an end user, we need to have the insight to know when to stop and what harms us as individuals. Thank you very much indeed, Wharton. That is actually a very nice place to stop. Um, I would love to continue this discussion, but I'm aware of all that is to come. And so um, I'd like to thank you all for giving us many points for reflection. I think that, that's been absolutely fascinating, a lovely introduction. So thank you all very much indeed. And then as we depart, and the next panel gets itself ready, or, um, then we, I'm very pleased to introduce some musicians from the NUS Conservatory of Music. And they're going to treat us to Fritz Kreisler's Schön Rosmarin.
Thank you very much indeed, and we'll be hearing more from you in, in a little while. Thank you. So now we move on to our second theme, which is well-being in the face of climate change. And I'm going to invite our panel to join us on stage. There we have Jolene Lin as our moderator, who is the director of the Asia-Pacific Center for Environmental Law. Please do come up. Please head up, to, all of you head up to the stage as I, as I introduce you. Thank you. This is, so, Jolene Lin. And then we have um, Lian Ping Ko, who is the director of the Centre for Nature Based Climate Solutions, also here in Singapore. Serge, I'm going to put Serge in the middle. Serge Hiroshi, you've already met. Um, Pok Wei Heng, from, who is a. Sustain, okay, that's fine. <laughs> sort yourselves out. Uh, uh, who is a uh, uh, sustainability consultant from New Zealand. Anna de Adio. Uh, from UNESCO in Paris. Then we have Elaine Tansu Yin from Malaysia, a student who participated in our pre-discussion with Stephen Chu. And we also have Nicole Shanahan, who is president of the Bar Echo Foundation in California, joining us virtually. Thank you all, welcome. I should say that full biographies of everybody are available online on NobelPrize.org if you wish to read more about any of our panellists. Um, to start us off, we're going to play a short video of Nobel laureate Stephen Chu, 1997 Nobel laureate in physics, talking about his view on well-being and climate change. Uh, he was the laureate who joined the students for the 90-minute pre-discussion. So, before Jolene starts her panel, we're going to play the video from Stephen Chu. If you think about energy, climate change, food, sustainability, getting out of poverty, it becomes, it merges into one big thing. Uh, and, and for example, if um, we're expecting that rainfall patterns will change, uh, we've seen this, uh, but it's going to uh, be more changes, the rainfall patterns that will affect food production. Uh, and the reservoirs and the water stresses will be increased. If you had unlimited clean energy, you can turn salt water into fresh water. Uh, but with limited amounts, there's something that's an issue. Uh, uh, power generation around the world is roughly a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions depending on how you count them, if you consider agriculture, the raising of food for us, for animals, and the methane and the N2O, the fertilizer runoff, which both methane and N2O are very potent greenhouse gases. And if you give it the, not the 100 year average, but the time it really is bad, uh, 20 years, agriculture and uh, forestry, that sort of stuff, is equal and maybe even greater than the power sector, electricity generation. So agriculture is a huge, huge part of this problem. And when people talk about going to zero emissions, you need electricity generation, transportation, agriculture, process heat, heat to make chemicals, plastics, steel, concrete, even if you decarbonize or dramatically change the way we make steel and concrete, we still need a lot of heat. Uh, and, and then finally, uh, plastics, we need a lot of heat with present technology. So the problem is huge. Uh, we don't have all the technologies today if, if um, we want to keep energy prices within a factor of two, but, um, and so that's another issue because energy prices uh, hit the poorest people of the world the worst. So, so those are the challenges uh, of, of food, energy, growing prosperity. Um, I'm hoping that the United States will set examples, so far not, <laughs> of getting uh, to more uh, vegetarian diets, less meat, uh, because if everybody adopts the American diet, uh, we don't have a big enough planet. So those are some of the things that we're thinking about, and there are some technologies that are very exciting, but I'm gonna leave it at that. Oh, one more thing. It takes three or four decades to make this huge change because it affects the infrastructure of everything. It won't happen in 
10 years or even 20 years. And even if electric vehicles, um, small light duty weight electric vehicles become the dominant purchase choice within 15 years, that means dominant means, you know, 60%, all the internal gasoline combustion engines will be on the road for 15 or 20 more years since they've been purchased. So that gives you a sense of the inertial lag of what we're looking at as well. Thank you very much um, for showing that clip. Um, that clip kind of sets out the frame for this dialogue on climate change and the, the emergency that we're in. I actually would like to ask for the next clip to be played because it kind of captures one of the key starting points for this uh, discussion about how seriously uh, does the public um, take um, climate change? In other words, how much, uh, how much public awareness is there of the climate emergency? So could I, we have the next clip, please? Thank you. I'm Edward, 19 years old, based, currently based in Singapore. So, Steve, Mr. Stephen, just now you mentioned more about the technologies as well as the R&D put into the climate change aspect. But what about the human factor behind it? Like just now you talk about public seriousness into transiting from beef to like pork to like chicken, as well as like, um, you mentioned in your introduction address that you have no aircon in your house, but I'm guilty of having one. <laughs> yeah, so just curious, how do you view the aspect of human factor in this aspect and how can we like increase the supply, but also to decrease the demand from the human side such that we can aim to uh, achieve carbon neutral in the near future? Yeah, only when people realize they, you know, what's the economic and personal cost to these things. Uh, there is a driver. The driver should be a worry about the future, but it doesn't hit home how long it will take to make the change and how hard it is. So time is running out because it's like the Titanic. You know, off in the distance, you might see an iceberg, but you may not believe it's there and you just wait, 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 and then pretty soon you can't turn the ship on time. Thank you. So the first question I have for the panel is really a question of what in their view are the things that we need to do um, to reduce the demand for carbon intensive uh, activities and goods, or what kind of changes do we need in our lifestyles? Um, and perhaps what's the role of government, what are the roles of academics, what's the role of healthcare practitioners, for example. So um, I'd like to just uh, go, go around by first starting with Lian Pin. Okay, sure. Uh, th thanks, Jolene, uh, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. I think the, the way I, I look at it is, is in, in two dimensions. Uh, one, you can imagine a graph uh, where, whereby on the x-axis you would have uh, the, the, the economic cost or the personal cost of an action or a change in behavior, as Professor uh, True mentioned earlier. And on the y-axis, you would have the uh, impact uh, that, the positive impact that that change in behavior could potentially uh, create. And if we divide that graph into qu quadrants, uh, I think then you can begin to have an idea of uh, those actions or those behavioral changes that would be on the lower left side of the quadrant, which are relatively easy to achieve, you know, low cost to us personally or in terms of our businesses or government, but, but also have uh, not that great of an impact, so low impact, low cost, low impact. I think we are already uh, tackling or addressing a lot of those uh, actions or implementing a lot of those actions, uh, including um, avoiding the use of straws, uh, moving away from uh, you know, one-time uh, plastic bags uh, in, in when we do our groceries. Uh, so, so, so those are the lowest hanging fruits. Uh, but then the, I think the challenge for, for us as individuals or corporations or governments is to start to tackle the other quadrants, especially um, maybe moving away from the low-cost, low-impact one to the low-cost, high-impact ones including potentially uh, shifting or changing our diets as, again, uh, the, the, the previous uh, the discussions has been, has been uh, alluding to. Changing our diet from um, uh, a, a meat-based, a protein-based uh, diet, or especially red meat-based diet, to a, a vegetarian or at least uh, you know, uh, proteins that are less uh, carbon-intensive. 
So that, that would cover the sort of the low cost, high impact quadrant. Uh, and then eventually moving to the uh, high cost and high impact quadrants. And I think that, that is the real challenge, but also where we could potentially see the greatest benefit. And that would be, I, I imagine, uh, the, the real shifts away from uh, uh, the use of fossil fuels, for example, uh, moving from um, internal combustion engines to EVs, and in fact, moving even beyond that to, uh, to public transports uh, away from personal or private uh, vehicles. So, so I think that, that might be a, 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 a useful framing of the problem and for us to begin to understand where we could uh, best contribute. Thank you, the scientist that you are. Very systematic. <laughs> Park, what about you? Yeah, um, absolutely. I think there's kind of like two frames I'd like to point out. The first is kind of looking at an individual level and then kind of growing in magnitude to a societal level. And I think on the individual level, social media is really picking up to grow that movement of encouraging a low waste, low emissions sort of lifestyle, what it involves in the foods that you pick, understanding maybe even the supply chains, where your food's coming from, uh, or even shopping local. And I think that's great and we need to continue to grow that. Where I see the real opportunities when we then flow on to more societal or concrete legislation or laws, like in, in New Zealand, um, we're the first country now to push forward with um, requiring large um, financial entities to proceed with climate-related disclosures. And that's basically saying you're a financial entity, you're dealing with a lot of money, how are you ensuring that low-carbon future that we're transiting towards? And disclosing that information, making it clear to your stakeholders, and I think that's important as well. So both lenses. Thank you. The knowledge and transparency that's required for that. Thank you, and Saj. <coughs> So <laughs> I think that incremental steps are rather easy to take uh, and the population will be ready to do it. But the big problem is to get rid of fossil fuels and to change the world in a way that we uh, decrease an, uh, the amount of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in a, in a very drastic way. And this uh, has to start now. And this is, these are steps which will be very important because they will change the way of life of people, and I am not sure that people are ready uh, for that. I think it's very important to be able to uh, increase the awareness of the general public about these problems. Now, in France, we say that uh, it's, uh, people are more interested by uh, what will happen at the end of the month and not at the end of the world. And uh, so they, are, they want to be sure that they will be able to have enough money uh, to live until the end of the month, which means to be able to cope with inflation, which is related to all the geopolitical problems we have today. And they are less sensitive to what will happen at the end of the world, quote unquote, due to the climate change. And as long as we are not able to make the people aware of the importance of what's going on, which will have an impact on their life if they are young enough, and certainly on the life of our children and grandchildren, then it will be very difficult to make them take the steps which are required for that. For instance, what is, what is essential, one way to reduce the consumption of, of CO2 would be just to tax more. And what people are doing now is to try to tax less for the gas price not to increase. Uh, in, in part of the interview, the, the, in the, the video that you are showing here, Steve True pointed to that by saying, if a politician in the United States decides to increase the price of gas, he's out of job uh, in the next two years. I think this is a big problem, the, the, the contrast between what we have to do now and what the people are ready to accept for what will happen later on. Thank you. Anna. Uh, thank you, and thanks for the opportunity to speak here. I think this is a really uh, important issue, and uh, eight, eight people out of 10 recognize that climate change is really a threat uh, for our future. Um, so I, I'm personally coming from the education side. I think that uh, education is of utmost important in this discussion, uh, but not just uh, in terms of uh, making people acquire the right skills and competence, but also trying to fill the gap between the knowledge, the values and the attitudes. So how to transmit uh, to young people now and in the future the importance of their actions. So how to transmit, the, empower them 
to engage with communities, uh, to engage in collective actions. There are huge and fundamental inequalities in how climate change is uh, approached by people. So it's uh, important to have government on board. I think it's important to have everybody on board in this discussion. It's really a collective actions that uh, require coordinations, that require uh, right budget and fiscal policies that require um, curricula to take on board the issue of climate change. We have moved from the issue of env environmental education uh, that was really something very spe specific to something that is more important now, that is environmental sustainability. And the, the word sustainability is really something that uh, makes the difference. So how to make the environment sustainable, how to bring people, and especially young people that are here today, to disseminate and advocate for climate change. And in this, uh, in this um, uh, endeavor, um, I think what is very important is also families, parents, um, because uh, I mean there are many studies that are showing that uh, how children behave uh, in the face of climate change is really also reflect um, mirrors what their parents. And so uh, the public action should really focus on preparing people, but also uh, trying to fill the gap where disadvantaged people, women, especially the gender gap in uh, uh, climate change approach is very different. Thank you, Anna. Um, uh, may I invite Elaine to share your views? Yeah, sure, thank you so much. So coming from a health expert, because I'm a junior doctor myself, um, I'm thinking from the very simple way, like why is public not serious about climate change? It's, I would take a very simple analogy is like, um, if you smoke today, you won't die tomorrow because this is um, the climate change impact is very chronic. It's slowly invading and it takes time to develop. And um, this is why I think uh, we need an intervention, let's say from health perspective, like how can we doctors give uh, planetary health diet based um, advices like what our previous speaker has mentioned. And also maybe in the intervention of behavioral science and they are very important in um, ensuring like low carbon and make the choices that are good for our health and also the environment. Yeah. And Nicole. Yeah, I, I really see the solution separated into three categories. Um, an economy for green transitions, regulation to help us get there, and innovation to make sure we have the right tools to scale into the future. Um, under the economy segment, Certainly, um, we need to rethink finance, green finance. Um, I'm seeing it, it uh, around the world, really looking at the green economy as an exciting investment opportunity. Um, incentive structures, I think that the carbon credit markets are growing significantly and with a great deal of sophistication. Um, really big funds are starting to get involved in looking at the carbon credit markets as a place to make quite meaningful um, bets. On the regula regulation side, I think that the government really can play a role um, with incentives, tax structures, infrastructure investments, um, creating green focused public goods, and even quantitative easing. And then on innovation, this is the part that I'm most excited about is um, making sure that we're facilitating the scientists and encouraging some of the best scientific innovations to see the market, to see grant um, uh, grant recipients, um, really taking in those funds and growing these projects that can sequester carbon. Um, there's so many interesting ways to sequester carbon. Effectively, the problem we're dealing with is carbon out of place. We just need to put the carbon in the right place and we can solve so many of climate's greatest challenges. Thank you. So from what I'm hearing, we've got some really interesting comments that, that kind of converge on the idea that, well, low, low impact, low cost is definitely something that we're already all doing, I think. Um, it's really where the dollar, where it really hurts is the high impact, high cost options. And yet we really, and the science tells us that we cannot continue to burn fossil fuels the way that um, we are. And in fact, the projections show that we are actually going to be burning more in 2030 than we that instead of cutting um, uh, emissions. 
Um, and we also have heard about how the, the idea of having not just governments and companies and academics play a role, but the fact that every one of us have a role to play, including people as parents. You know, we all play multiple, we have multiple identities. Um, the, uh, the next clip that I would like to invite, um, uh, uh, that I would like to have screened, um, brings about this point about price, the idea that it really costs money and whether and what we need to do, um, whether the, the price of action is something that people can bear or you know, even, uh, not even can bear, but we have to bear it and are, they, are we prepared for it? So may we have the next clip, please? Hi, I'm currently a research assistant um, working in the National University of Singapore. So um, currently I'm actually working on um, consumers' perceptions on uh, cultured meat and other meat alternatives. So I think our discussion here is very pertinent to what I'm doing right now. So it seems that the public is more uh, concerned about the price or financial incentives of uh, their choices. So even with the increased availability of cultured meat and meat alternatives, alternative proteins like microprotein and heme protein, um, not, a, not a lot of people are actively accepting this uh, these alternatives. So do you think it's better to work with current food systems that we have for making productions of assist existing conventional meat more efficient, uh, the way to go in comparison to, you know, pouring in a lot of effort to make people change their diets and um, working on these meat alternatives that uh, the public may not even uh, be, be very uh, interested in adopting. Well, first, let me agree with you. Price matters the most in any consumer choice. And every, anything we buy, it's always about price and cost and money. And, and then good to the world is secondary. So um, both Chloe Tan and Steve Chu agree, um, agree that price matters most to the consumer. Price first, environment second, and yet agriculture is one of the biggest sources of greenhouse gas emissions. So first, I'd like to invite the panelists, starting from Nicole, so just be very equal in terms of the rounds. Um, first of all, do you agree that price matters most to the consumer? And um, secondly, what do you think are some of the things um, that would really bring down the f energy and f um, water foot uh, footprint of food production? Yeah, this is an area that I spend a, a lot of time in. Um, so I have one example I wanted to share, and I actually have a sample of a product here. It's um, a high heat cooking oil, um, and this is currently $30, 30 US dollars per bottle for this bottle. And that's a problem. We are trying to get this down to about $4 a bottle, which would allow it to compete with other vegetable oils here in the United States. And here's... Here's the case study. So two of the top three drivers of global deforestation are vegetable oil, oil crops. Um, every minute, the planet loses 40 football fields of rainforest due um, to deforestation. And um, a lot of this is due um, to the massive amount of vegetable oil we are now consuming. Um, and it's a, I mean, just to break it down, it's a $232 billion market. Um, there's more vegetable oil in production globally than beef, chicken, shrimp, and cheese combined. So I really think that as a community, what we can do is focus on um, tractable issues, like how do we take something like cooking oil and how do we grow it? So this cooking oil was not created um, from um, grown vegetables on land. It was created through fermentation processes. So how you think about making um, uh, fermentated products like beer, for example. So it's grown um, in a um, giant metal container. And, you know, it's, it's fascinating because I, I looked at this and I said, okay, well, but are people actually going to want to consume it? Would I give this to my child? And I looked at the data and cooking oil is actually incredibly bad for humans as well. So it's um, uh, linked to chronic disease, including heart disease, 
which is now the number one cause of death in the world. Um, regular, con regularly consuming um, vegetable oil increases risk of death by 62%. Um, and, you know, part of it is because a lot of these cooking oils, um, when you heat them at a high heat, become quite unstable. And our bodies um, don't do well with these, like, radical particulates in our system. So when you have something like cultured oil, you can take a microbe and um, effectively feed it a feedstock, and that produces a fat through fermentation. And... Um, the studies are showing that this is actually much healthier for human consumption. Humans have been fermenting things for hundreds of generations. And um, so our bodies know how to digest them. And I think, you know, uh, sorry, uh, you can cut me off, but no, I, I'm sorry. I, I mean, this is the case studies that I, I feel is like a perfect example of like where we need to be in agriculture and climate and health. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to keep, I cut you off, Nicole, sorry. Um, but yes, Elaine. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Um, I would say I have not much expertise in like food choices, but I think one of my peers mentioned in our pre-recorded sessions is about food labeling. I think um, that should play a role in, let's say, um, it can be printed and um, be transparent about consumer choices, about carbon emissions, and so on. So that's actually interesting, Elaine, because I remember you were sharing with me over email that one of the things that wasn't really highlighted in these dialogues was the health impacts of climate change. Um, so I wanted to invite you to, to share on this issue of food labeling. Do you think we can tackle two birds with a stone? Food labeling as a way to deal with, let's say, the obesity crisis, uh, but and also tackle some of the, um, the and, and, and address climate change. Um, personally, I think it would work, but the thing is, sometimes I feel like transparency is a double-edged sword. Um, it's like uh, when you mentioned too much about food labeling, but you have to also tell the consumers and um, our, um, our patients, let's say, we have to tell them why are this important instead of just understanding what food labeling is about. Because looking at it, um, the data and so on, like everybody can just search online and, and everybody can understand too what they read. But the thing is, what impacts would they be? And this would be something that maybe as healthcare practitioners, we can involve in this part of work and to be part of the solutions for this thing. So it also comes down to the issue of education, educating the patient. Anna. Yes. Um, I think that's really a good question. And uh, the point is, again, that there is not a unique answer because the uh, prices may be more important for someone and uh, how to educate people to make the change happening. So um, let me start from a different perspective because I think that's really important here. Uh, we see when uh, we talk about organic food, for instance, uh, who benefits of that? Um, there are different people, there are different, and very often the most, the wealthiest, the most affluent, the most advantaged benefit of these uh, different choices or opportunity option they can have. And so, I mean, uh, that's, that's something that is really important, how to make people understand that the issue is multidimensional, is very complex. So you may think that uh, um, to reduce the footprint uh, for food, um, you can carbon footprint for food, you may think saying eat local, but eat local in per se doesn't mean much because uh, transport uh, represent a very low share or on greenhouse uh, um, emission. So what, mean, what really matters is about the food, mm? uh, because producing beef or lamb uh, compared to producing uh, plants uh, have, have different footprint and uh, greenhouse emission. So once again, it's about uh, uh, giving the right message. So labeling, I think it's very important, but there are also many other policies. Uh, Sarah was talking about fiscal policies, taxing, um, taxing foods that maybe can, uh, can be really um, 
unhealthy in the sense of the environment may be an important measure, but also having signpost financing budget policies. So for instance, at the Global Education Monitory Report at UNESCO, we are collecting um, data, on qualitative data on legislation and policies on climate change. Uh, and what's really interesting is that you see that the countries that champion climate change uh, uh, issues uh, are not uh, doing that in a piecemeal approach. They do it across uh, the spectrum in different kind uh, of ways. Uh, we are talking about the Ministry of Education, but the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Budget, they work together uh, to realize a uh, uh, good solution. And I think what is really important is that countries learn from each other because there may be things that work in some countries and uh, having this kind of information avail available may help other countries to realize their potential. So I think that's uh, a very complex issue, but there is a lot to learn and to transform the world. Thank you. And Saj, would you be able to share with us some of the scientific breakthroughs of things that are happening that could really help us reduce the energy and carbon footprint of um, a food production? So <clears throat> I think this competition between uh, the importance of price for the population and the uh, awareness of the change, the climate change, is very interesting. Uh, you said at the beginning that uh, price comes first and environment second. I think it's already a progress because if you had made this, asked this question 10 years ago, environment would be much, much lower on the list. So the, the awareness about the climate change is now building up in the population. And uh, I think that in the coming years with what we are seeing today, uh, the balance between uh, the, the the fact that people are worried about the increase of prices and the fact that they're worrying about the climate change will shift. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, because it will be produced by uh, very bad and catastrophic events. So we may hope that in the future, people will understand that we are in a kind of war, a war against climate change. And we need to have a change in the economy which reflects that. But this has to be a global change. You cannot increase taxes in one country, mm. not in others. You cannot change uh, the economy in one country without doing that at the, at the global level. And I hope that at some point there will be a consciousness of the population will uh, grow in, in this direction. And this is also related to education. You mentioned the fact that you have to educate people. People have to understand what is at stake why the CO2 is bad, why we need new sources of energy, and also have an idea of the orders of magnitude. Mm -hmm. uh, is that you need, you, you need renewable energy, but you also need nuclear power plants because uh, you, need, you will need in the future a lot of electricity uh, to replace fossil fuels for transportation. You will ha need to have electric cars, electric uh, vans and transportation, and electricity cannot be produced with fossil fuels anymore. It, it cannot be produced at the scale that, that we need it from solar or, or uh, wind mills. You need nuclear energy, and there is a reluctance in the population to use nuclear energy because they don't know exactly uh, what it is. They analyze and they evaluate the risk in a way which is uh, biased by ideology. So all this is part of education, and we have really to change the way we are uh, living. And the last remark I would like to make, this has to be done on the global scale. As in the previous, when we talked about the, the digital world, we said also that to be efficient, uh, new regulations have yes. to be taken globally in all countries, and it is the same uh, for the, uh, the climate change. And what worries me is that at the global level, we are not going in the direction of taking uh, common decisions. The geopolitical situation today goes exactly against all what we want. Yeah. For instance, nuclear power plants yeah. were supposed to be dangerous when it was not dangerous. And now when we see what, ha what can happen to nuclear power plants in a zone of war, it will increase th the fear against nuclear power plants and it will be even more difficult to use it yeah. at the scale we need to do it. So all these all this problems are 
entangled with each other, and that makes the solution of the problem very difficult. You raised some really important points, and I think that uh, uh, Paul, I would like to invite you to, to respond to, to some of the comments that have been made. Such a big topic. I think one of the things that we actually don't talk about is that different countries have different carbon emission intensity. When you look at Africa, for example, this is a one point something billion people continent. 20%, 20 plus percent of the population, they emit 3% of the world's emissions. A bulk of our emissions actually comes from what we term the global north, and it's a hotly contested topic, right? Like the global north referred to um, historically rather wealthy and developed countries. Uh, think of Australia, think of New Zealand, think of Europe. 25% um, of the world's population that has been soaring in terms of the emissions per capita. And, and so whilst I do agree, absolutely, we need a global effort, it also needs to be contextualized as well to the needs of different countries. Mm -hmm. Some countries need more wiggle room and space to develop. They've not had any space to develop. They've been put under big situations of debt, sometimes not in their favor, and they still have to lower the emissions. We need to figure out how that works with a low carbon emission, uh, with, a, with a low carbon economy. Whereas definitely the developed countries, the global north, need to start thinking about what their obligations or responsibilities are. Um, yeah, and, and, and I think that's just one of the points. It's, it's a point of justice, ultimately, and mm. every country has a different role to play. Thank you for raising that point. Yan Pin? Uh, yeah, great, great, great discussion. So, so again, uh, for me, I think it's, it's important to, to uh, personally to have a, the right framing or useful framing of the problem. And, and to me, it's, it's a, a matter of uh, understanding the price or the cost of an action or intervention versus the uh, cost of inaction, of not doing anything about the problem. Um, on the cost side, uh, I think we've already talked about you know, the, the price or the cost of uh, new products that are more, maybe more sustainably produced that could help reduce or avoid emissions. Um, uh, could be the cost of new technologies that could help us uh, sequester or capture or remove carbon from the from dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, it could also include opportunity costs, uh, the cost of not continuing on our very profitable, lucrative, uh, business-as-usual um, uh, uh, activities. So that, that opportunity cost, I think, also has to be acknowledged. Now, compared to that, we have to also deal with the cost of inaction. Um, there are various ways that people have uh, come up with to, 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 to have a number for that. What, what is the social cost of carbon emissions? Uh, I think recently uh, there was a paper in Nature I think over the last couple of days that uh, estimated that the cost of inaction or the social cost of carbon could be as high as uh, $180 per ton of carbon. What that means is we, if we continue to allow carbon emissions to, uh, to increase or to continue, um, uh, that is the estimated amount uh, of the cost uh, to society, including direct costs of you know, wealth, uh, healthcare costs, of pollution, of heat stress, and so on, but also extending to indirect costs uh, of, of not protecting our shores or allowing our shores to be exposed to uh, sea level rise, for example, flash floods, and so on and so forth. So those would be the cause of inaction. So I think um, perhaps with more information uh, and, and, and education, and more science to uh, better identify and, and quantify costs on both sides uh, that could help inform decisions and decisions of the policymakers and business leaders on, on the, the appropriate action to take. Thank you. I think that's, that's really a, an important point. Like I think for policymakers, cost-benefit analysis is what we do, but as individuals, when we go to the supermarket, for example, we don't have enough information to do that cost-benefit analysis, and that's really something to, to look at. Um, I'd like to invite uh, for the next clip to be played. Um, thank you. Teenager living in a low-lying island, I would say that the people of my generation, like those from the rest of the world, uh, we really have our own hopes and dreams in a habitable, habitable future. Uh, we all hear about how like, we need a radical shift in terms of combating climate change in our lifestyle choices, 
in energy capture. But for much of the decade, um, countries like Singapore only accounted for like 0.1% of global carbon uh, emission. So my question is, what role realistically do small countries like Singapore or other countries in the global south really have in the fight against climate change? Because ironically, I really feel like the smallest and poorest countries in the world, from like the Maldives to Mozambique, is really bearing the brunt of climate change. World-leading small countries can set an example of, of what to do. That could be best practices that other countries can pick up. Now, I agree with you 100% that the poorest countries bear the brunt of this for sure. And that's the injustice of all this, because they contributed nothing to the problem. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Um, so the, uh, the clip was, was, was intended to, to, to highlight the fact that there's this issue of climate justice, the idea that small countries probably have uh, most small countries have played a very small role and contribute very little to climate change. Mm -hmm. Now, instead of asking the panelists to tell us what they think is the role of you know, countries to tackle climate change, you have a rare opportunity to kind of address a room. And um, I just want to ask you to share, what do you think is this one message that you would like to share with this audience about the importance of tackling climate change or the issues that you think um, that speak to you most dearly uh, in, in relation to this issue. And I'll start with um, uh, Lian Pin. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so I'll be quick. I think we're running out of time. Uh, I, I think for me, the, it's, it's the recognition that the, the problem we face when it comes to climate change is a global problem. But the solutions to, to a large extent are, have to be local because uh, most of us uh, live, live in the democracy, so, so we have to deal with uh, the uh, various uh, uh, sometimes com competing interests of, of society and, and therefore uh, understanding the trade-offs at the local level and, and having the political will and the, the political uh, ability for, for persuading um, different sides and different um, interest groups to, to move in the same direction, maybe not at the same speed but the same direction to tackle this problem, recognizing the costs and benefits, I think I think that's that's key to to, uh, to, to addressing this problem. Thank you. Oh. Um, I think like a very salient example actually is the Pakistan floods, and I was talking to someone directly in Pakistan, so shout out to Hassan, um, to figure out and try to understand what's happening on the ground. And what we know is that a third of Pakistan is flooded. Their emissions intensity is one of the lowest in the world. Um, 35 million people displaced, so the, a sense of scale of that is that it's five times as many displaced people as the Ukraine and Russia crisis right now. The amount of people that are displaced is equivalent to Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Switzerland combined in population size. And this is just the beginning. As climate change ramps up and increases, we're going to see more and more climate migrants and climate refugees. And um, I think the Institute of Economics and Peace has forecasted it's going to be as crazy as 1.2 billion people by 2050. This is a massive kind of seismic shift. And I, again, it's, it's up to the developed countries. I literally have like a little um, diagram I wanted to show, but there's no time, um, about how the emissions intensity of the developed world has really just skyrocketed whilst Pakistan is still here within the, the safe bounds of our planet. And we need to really think what the developed countries need to be doing. It needs to enter far beyond dialogue to actually reparations and actual action. So that's for me. Yeah, I, I think I will stress the same points. I think if there is a message to deliver now, it's a, first a message of urgency. The situation is bad and it will get worse. And you see the kind of catastrophe which happens. So this feeling of urgency has to be taken into account. The second message is it's a need for solidarity, solidarity between nations. And in fact, all of this is already included in the Paris Agreement in 2015. It was clear from that time that the solution had to be global, that rich countries had to put money into the development of poor countries for fairness and for justice, so social and, and political and economical justice. The only problem is that uh, even if uh, the contract has been signed, even if promises have been made, they don't follow at the pace they should. 
and, and this is a, really a big problem. And again, it amounts to a political and geopolitical problem. Thank you. I'm, I, I know I'm running out of time, and I've, to present, I've been told to wrap up, but I want to make sure that Elaine, Nicole, and Anna have an opportunity to comment. So one minute each, please. Okay. So very quickly, um, one estimate, the World Bank in 2018 has estimated that for 1% increase in GDP, there is 0.5% increase in greenhouse emissions. So the, the question is how to decouple these two processes, how to um, foster inclusive and greening growth, uh, thinking that this, this requires also a huge change in the skills. Um, so message of urgency, message of uh, um, advocate, advocate for climate change because this is important. Uh, uh, through education, learn to advocate and uh, to build this uh, solidarity and uh, especially push for coordination methods across countries. The, 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 the issue of climate change requires huge coordination mechanism because we want all or most of us the same thing, a better planet and a better life. Yeah, sure. Um, well, actually for myself, I really think the most direct impact of climate change is actually the health impact. But it is very, very often being ignored when we talk about this climate change. And this is, you can see for the world now, it's deepening the health inequalities with, because climate change impacts people differently. And then secondly, it would increase the healthcare financing burdens. It will expand a lot of human resources. And also there's a lot of, like, we are not ready yet for climate change and especially for all these like extreme um, climate events and for myself i just have like three points that i want to mention is first is education and education not just within junior doctors ourselves i think youth is a big power that we can make changes yeah. and secondly it will be like what um a previous speaker has mentioned about advocate um, as a clinician myself, I also learned how to advocate and how to talk climate to my patients and to my peers. And lastly, I would like to emphasize about intersectoral collaborations. I'm from a healthcare, um, healthcare sector. I do not know much about what is happening in other people's field as well. And I think interdisciplinary and interprofessionals um, will be the only solutions to move forward in this climate change agenda. And this is a message I would like to deliver today. Thank you. Thank you, Lane. Nicole, you have the closing note. Energize effective solutions. Focus on very specific solutions. Don't pay attention to the noise. It's very emotional. Try to leave the emotion at the door. Fight for what works. That's it. Thank you. And on that note, we'll end this panel. Thank you very much for your time. It's a, it's, it's Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Jolene, and all of your panelists. Um, I'm sorry to make you compress so much into so little. Thank you. Thank you. Marvelous job. OK. Um, in the digital uh, well-being session, people have talked about trusting their sources of information. And so I own up to full responsibility for having got, trusted my information too much. And I told you that the uh, musicians were going to play Chrysler. They, of course, played Haydn. So I'm, I'm sorry for that. But now they're going to play Borod in his trio for strings.
Thank you very much to Georgi Moroz and Sherzod Abdiev on violin and Bexod Oblayoro on cello. Thank you, and we'll see you again soon. Um, now, to get us started on the next theme, which is the last one before coffee, and then there's a coffee break, uh, economic well-being, we would, we would like to hear from uh, Armida Alice Jabana, who is the Executive Secretary of ESCAP, the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Distinguished participants, dear colleagues, I would like to express my appreciation to the National University of Singapore for inviting me to the Distinguished Nobel Prize Dialogue and I'm very pleased to share my perspectives on economic growth, well-being, and inequality. Let me start the conversation with a topic on the linkage between economic growth and well-being. Economic growth, when inclusive, is fundamental for reducing poverty. The fast economic growth in Asia and the Pacific helped to lift more than 1.1 billion people out of extreme poverty and bring down the overall poverty incidence to less than one-tenth of its 1990 level. Moreover, economic growth is not just associated with reducing poverty, but also other broader measures of well-being. Economic growth increases the government's revenue, including tax revenue, making it possible to spend more on key public services, such as health, education, and social protection. On the other hand, improved human capital also increases productivity and accelerates economic growth. However, the region's economic success has not been enjoyed equally by all. It has not contributed to the creation of decent employment for all, and has even deepened informal and vulnerable employment in many countries. Income inequality actually increased in the Asia-Pacific region between the 1990s and 2010s, when it was generally decreasing in other parts of the world. Rising inequality in income and wealth has led to the so-called scarring effects, especially during the pandemic, which brings the issue of inequality to the fore. The poor and vulnerable groups, including youth and women, were disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. When we talk about the workforce, we also need to look at the impact of youth unemployment, fewer job prospects, lower pay, and fewer opportunities to develop skills have a major effect on the future productivity and earning potential of youth, resulting in poverty and income inequality. Furthermore, not only could youth unemployment result in missed opportunities in terms of economic growth and development, persistently high levels of youth unemployment may also lead to social unrest and political instability. Therefore, active labor market policies targeting youth, such as trainings, Job search and facilitating reallocation of workers would be vital to realizing the full potential of youth in the labor market. The question is how we can reduce inequality. High levels of inequality constrain economic growth, generate political and socio-economic instability, and lower trust and solidarity in society. While COVID-19 has created a generational opportunity to build a more equitable and sustainable world, global mega trends such as climate change, digitalization, and urbanization may widen inequalities in the absence of targeted policy action. To reduce inequality, I would suggest the three priorities of the Building Forward Fair Policy Agenda. The first priority would be on structural policy that is addressing the root cause of inequality. Governments should address the root cause of inequality through structural policy. Our analysis shows that the rise in inequality in Asia-Pacific countries was primarily driven by changes in pre-distribution. Therefore, 
government strategy for inclusive development should steer towards a job-rich path, support job-friendly technological innovation, and empower labor in the job market through decent employment. The second priority is for central banking, which has to see through a new lens. I urge central banking to move beyond its traditional role and share the onus of promoting economic inclusiveness, not least because high and persistent levels of inequality can reduce monetary policy effectiveness. Right now, only half of central banks in the region have taken up inclusive finance concern. This is really a missed opportunity. While ensuring inflation stability is the core mandate of central banks, they should also consider the impact of monetary policy on inequality. Additionally, central banks can support inclusive development through official reserve management, currency issuance, and financial sector regulation. The third priority would be on fiscal policy, that is, to tax fair and spend smart. Last but not least, governments should improve the effectiveness of their fiscal policy, which has been traditionally used to reduce inequality. Developing Asian Pacific countries must not cut spending on healthcare, education, and social protection. These three areas have the largest impact for inequality reduction and long-term growth, but are often the first to get cut in times of crisis as we have seen in the past. Revenues need to be increased as tax collection remains low in the region. It is time to tax fair. This means ensuring that everyone pay their fair share, broadening the tax base, and shifting the tax burden from the lowest income household by making corporate and personal tax more progressive. Moreover, governments should spend smart to reduce inefficiencies in expenditure. For instance, while spending on education may reduce inequality, its efficiency in reducing inequality could be much higher when invested at the primary and secondary levels rather than the tertiary level. By addressing inequality and reducing poverty, we can definitely improve well-being of our societies and advance overall economic growth. We stand ready to support these efforts and I wish all of you a very fruitful dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Armida. And so now may I invite my panel on stage, please. So we have in this panel on economic well-being, Monica Wihaja, who is a visiting fellow at the Yusuf Aishak Institute here in Singapore, Jessica Pan, who is Associate Professor of Economics at NUS, Junofi Rosarina, who is a behavioral economist from India, and Jan Suraman, who is an advocate for youth in Indonesia. And moderate what, what oh close up the no, close up the gap. <laughs> and moderating we have somebody known to you all, I'm sure. Lin Kui Ling, who is the uh, executive producer of China News Asia's In Conversation. Uh, the pre-discussion that happened uh, with the students um, and Junofi and Jan were part of that discussion was with Paul Romer, the 2018 uh, laureate in economic sciences, former chief economist at the World Bank. And we're going to begin this session by playing a short video clip of Paul's thoughts on economic well-being. Well, I guess the, you know, the starting point will be to ask, how does, how does any discussion about macroeconomics connect to, to well-being? Uh, I think uh, the, it's, it's very easy to get focused on these proxy measures like, well, GDP is growing or it's not growing, inflation's growing, it's not growing. But the, the focus today, and I think the focus more generally, should be on what is it that actually gives people uh, a sense of uh, a satisfied, living a satisfied life. This is something we don't talk about very much, but it's really what matters when you uh, think about what we could be doing differently or what our goals should be. 
Uh, we should be trying to make it possible for as many people as possible to have lives that feel uh, satisfying to them. Think about the consequences of uh, the Great Depression. A fall in GDP, a fall in employment, uh, hyperinflation. This can cause huge suffering for individuals. Uh, but one of the consequences of that macroeconomic instability was um, a, a sense in some countries that we had to radically change how we organized ourselves. Uh, when economists, uh, including economists where I was trained at the University of Chicago, looked at Italy, Germany, uh, Russia, they said, wow, it's very dangerous to have states that get too strong. So uh, after World War II, a lot of intellectual uh, discussion went in the direction of saying the market is good, government is bad, and we need to pare back or shrink or limit government because it's dangerous if the government becomes too strong. The point I'm emphasizing more at this, uh, at this time is that we need a government which is strong enough to uh, constrain the market sector and make sure the market sector does things that are good for us. We as citizens need to be able to say through our government, if, if we believe this, we don't want to live in that kind of a world where organizations like firms treat people like disposables. We want to live in a world where there are long-term relationships, where people invest together for mutual gain. And if new technologies are pushing us in a different direction, we want to push back with the law to go back to the kind of arrangements that we had before. We can take advantage of the new technologies, but we want to use them in a way that will benefit us, us all. So the, the new message is you have to have both a market that can encourage innovation, but a government which directs that innovation for the well-being of, of everyone. Okay. I hope this is working. Ah, yes. Right. Welcome to this afternoon's session on economic well-being. I'm going to pick up on the first thing that Prof. Roma said about economic well-being. Now, what is that really? Um, sounds very nice, but what does it really mean? Now, he used the word satisfaction, and it can be used in so many interesting ways, like I'm not getting satisfaction, um, in all sorts of cute and rather maybe cheeky ways too. If we come down, though, to the idea of satisfaction, is it one that we feel is equivalent to well-being? I don't know. In fact, this is what this panel is all going to be about. But before I go any further, I'm just going to ask, without us having any discussion yet, for us to just take the word in its completely normal sense, whatever way you want to think about it, and let's have a quick show of hands. How many of you feel that you lead a satisfied life. Put up your hands if you do. <laughs> okay, from what I can see, I guess that, what, what do you think that was? On our panel, that was only two out of five. All right, on my rough <laughs> estimate, that means that we're probably only at about what? About 30, 40, 30%, 40% 40 of uh, the panel. Over here, I'd say maybe a little bit higher. You guys were a little bit more satisfied with your lives. About 40% of the people put up their hands. Would you say that was right, Jessica, Monica, the economists? Okay, let's have this discussion, and then we'll ask the question again and see if we've moved that meter uh, any further, or whether or not some of you might actually feel you have less satisfied lives. All right, so let's move to my panel, and let's go around. So, Jian. What does a satisfied life mean to you? It's a very deep and philosophical question, which we spend our entire life answering it. Maybe in your, you know, I, I used to be, want to be like Indiana Jones, uh, like, you know, like you know, going to tombs and discovering this belongs to a museum, like, <laughs> like that. And then I watch Star Wars and oh my God, I want to space explorations. I want to be, you know, like be one with the force and everything. I'm, I'm all for science fiction. And then 
Later on, I want to be a businessman. I used to read, I used to look up to Donald Trump in my high school because I want to be that rich. But later on, of course, I figured out more things. Uh, but then <laughs> I went through so many phases. But as for now, I just, you know, I just, I'm just a development worker, a consultant in a way that, uh, you know, trying to promote the well-being of uh, young people in terms of social economic needs. And I'm happy with my um, two cats, Bernie and Gandhi. You know where the name came from. I'm happy with my mom. I'm happy with my partner who is a dentist. And I'm ready to say to her, like, I'm ready to be a house husband, a gokushu fudo, in a way that, you know, uh, for us to take turns in, in our charts in our home in the future. So I think at the end, satisfaction means it's like, I know what I want and I know how to get it. But and you didn't put your hand up. I, I paid put, put you my did hand put your hand up. Oh, you were not high enough. Oh, not high enough. I'm not I high enough. <laughs> because I was still bad. humbled, like I'm still on my way. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, but I'm on my way. But it's you know, I know what I want. I know how to get it, and I know when I cannot get it by myself. I know how to find help for it. So I think that's a satisfied life for me. Mm, find help and where to get it. Mm. Do you know if you did not put up your hand? I did, I did. Oh, you did as yeah. well? Oh, yeah. everybody did put up a hand. Wow. Anyway. Oh, 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 oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> the prof here didn't put up her hand. She's the only one. The rest of us are satisfied. <laughs> Why are you satisfied? Right, Why, so... what, is, what is it that makes life satisfactory to right. you? So I have a slightly similar opinion to what Jian had. Um, I also see satisfaction or a satisfied life as a philosophical concept which basically means that it's just super hard to describe, or it's not really a yes or no answer, right? Um, satisfaction is sort of getting what you need or want, and deciding what you need or want is a combination of, I don't know, your imagination of what you could be and what you see around, right? And I think the set of needs and wants that people have is just shooting up drastically now with media because you see this whole lifestyle that you could potentially have, right? Which was just not visible in the past. I mean, if you just lived in a village with no TV or social media, um, you were happy because you were really close to the people who lived around you, right? Like your aspiration dreams were limited by what you saw, mm. which is absolutely not the case now. Now you see your classmates, I don't, I don't know, skydiving and uh, potentially going to the moon. Uh, you'll never know. <laughs> so I think given all of that, it's a really hard question to answer. And uh, yeah, go on. Well, if you notice, already from the two answers that have been given, neither Junofi nor Ogean mentioned things. They didn't say, I'm satisfied because I just bought myself a new BMW. Right. Uh, right? I, I don't think satisfaction is like an end that you reach, right? Of I do this, 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 and then I'm satisfied. It's, it's more like you're just happy along the way, right? It's, it's content and yeah, yeah. And it's metaphysical. And yet we sit here on the economic well-being panel and most of the time, as anybody who's interested in economics, it does have to do with, well, a lot of physical things, doesn't it? So, Jessica, satisfied with life? So I'm quite satisfied with life, and I think before I realized that Gian and Junofi hadn't fully put up their hands, I was going to say there appeared to be a very s strong age gradient in a degree of satisfaction and, um, <laughs> and, and the you know, relative willingness to put up one's hands. Um, so I have a slightly different take, I think, on uh, the notion of satisfaction, at least for me. Um, I think of it a little bit less of a metaphysical way, and maybe that's because as an economist, I'm trained to always try to break down things in my mind. And so I think for me, satisfaction, when I think about the concept and also how it relates to, to myself is, you know, I think about time as being the constraint that we all have, right? It's a binding constraint. And so we're all thinking about how to spend our time, you know, effectively, the quality of that time, and basically, you know, where do we put our time? Um, and so time is a very important input into satisfaction, right? And so if you think about, for most people, by and large, you spend your time on things like, you know, work or school, you spend your time with friends and family, you spend your time, your leisure on yourself. And so, you know, clearly these are likely to be um, important determinants of your satisfaction. And moreover, the quality of that time, so, you know, your health and your ability to spend that time effectively probably matters. Now, um, you know, to some extent, if you think about these um, inputs, right, 
um, you want to know, in order to be satisfied, you know, how well are you doing um, in terms of these inputs? You know, are these in inputs into your life sort of garnering you satisfaction? And you sort of think, you know, in some way, there is a sense in which there is a social comparison. You know, it's, it's not a vacuum. You know, people don't evaluate these things like, you know, today I'm, I'm satisfied with this. It's, it's not in a vacuum. It's, it's, it's largely cultural. There's a social aspect to it. Um, very often it's, you know, around how am I faring? Am I providing well for my family? Am I doing well at my job? You know, um, how am I faring relative to my peers? So I think there's that certain sense in which it, it's, it, it might vary from culture to culture. It might vary from, you know, as part of your identity. But there's something also quite fundamental about the way in which we live in society that matters for that. Uh, there's one other aspect, though, which I think it's a little sort of... Um, something I'm still grappling in my mind about how it all fits in, which is also this idea that, you know, I want to achieve my maximal potential. You know, this idea that I set goals for myself and I reach it, and if I don't, then I'm not very satisfied. And so there's this sense in which, you know, given my ability, my circumstances, my own expectations, you know, have I done my best? Um, have I reached a point? Mm -hmm. And I think it's, you know, um, there's this interesting sort of, uh, you know, uh, distinction between happiness and satisfaction, which maybe we'll get to. And so um, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of leave it at that. Okay, so we've had this point now brought up twice, if you noticed. You know, if you mentioned that as well, if you see other people doing something which is fantastic, it breeds that sense of dissatisfaction, um, which is curious, isn't it? Um, so when we look at ourselves as, you know, countries, economies, do we look and say, gee, I'm dissatisfied, you know, that we as a country are not, don't have a GDP like that other guy, i.e. Switzerland or Singapore. Does that make us feel uncomfortable? Um, curious question. So, the person who is not satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, I... I don't know if I should my uh, I put my I should put my hands up or not. But then I mean I'm I'm grateful for my life. But yeah. that questions of like whether I'm fully satisfied in my life, I think you know it's really difficult to answer. In Chinese, there's uh, an idiom that says you know you should be satisfied with what you have. And I think once you are satisfied with what you have, you have a satisfied satisfied life. But I think uh, in reality, you know, our human instincts are not really created to appreciate moderation. We always want more in life. I mean, I could be grateful for my life, but I know inside that I still have like, uh, I still want more things. Uh, that's why I didn't put my hands up. Um, but I would like to take uh, the discussion a little bit into the questions of what can make us less satisfied in life in the future. So I think what uh, Paul Romer uh, alluded to it's about meaning and purpose in life. And that relates to self-worthiness and self-dignity. You know, you can imagine in the future if AI starts to take our jobs, take over our jobs, it might not be your job or my job, but maybe like the taxi drivers, for example. I think that could make people less satisfied because they cannot do what they would like to do in life. Uh, and uh, so we need to question ourselves, you know, what the future of work is like and what can make people less happy you know, when AI and robots start to take over our lives. Uh, we may be able to, we may receive, let's say, like universal basic incomes, or we may be reskilling ourselves, but then if we cannot do what we'd like to do, you know, me as an economist, for example, if uh, robots uh, can do, you know, my job better uh, than uh, how I do my job as an economist, then that could make me less satisfied. And the second thing is what uh, Jessica already mentioned is about relativity. Like we, you know, with social media, you know, ubiquitous uh, present to us all the time, we continue to uh, compare ourselves to others. And, you know, we've discussed about like misinformation. We don't know how much uh, of the stories, you know, we hear or see in the social medias are, are true, but we still fall for these stories. So uh, it's very difficult to avoid not to compare ourselves when we have like social media, uh, like everywhere around us. So we need to think about, you know, what the future of information is like. And then the third one uh, is about uh, solidarity or, you know, a sense of belonging to communities. Mm -hmm. You know, one needs to satisfy uh, one's existential needs, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, you can be very rich, ultra rich, but if you don't, if you don't have friends or relatives that you can feel you can rely on when you need support, you know, that sense of belonging to communities, I think you can be less satisfied uh, in life. So that future of society is very important. If you notice though, from all the things our four panelists have said here, and I don't know whether it's amongst you as well, um, the only person who mentioned GDP was me. 
<laughs> so isn't it strange, though, that we talk about satisfaction, and yet we never talk about these tools, which are the fundamental tools that policymakers, that governments, mm -hmm. that even as activists, as civil society, as journalists, are the measures that we have to use when we aggregate all our ideas of satisfaction. And in fact, there are very few countries. I mean, Bhutan mm -hmm. claims that it does a mm -hmm. happiness index. Mm -hmm. I know that the Danes have a center that you know, researches into happiness. Should we really be discussing in parliament not what the GDP is and how much it's growing, but rather what, how much happiness we're growing? Are you economists really on the wrong track? <laughs> <laughs> so with that, Jian, yes. do we use GDP as a measure or should we give it up and just say we need to create a new measure? We need to make a new measure for how G Indonesia's what? GDP per capita, don't bother talking about it. Sri Mulani should stop talking about that. She needs to talk about happiness, well, satisfaction. I'm yeah, Miss Lynn, I feel like I'm put on the spot because I'm not the economist here. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll try to answer what I can. Um, I think there's been also an ongoing debate, right, about the concept of GDP, the concept of growth. I think if some of you also read Jason Hickel, also with uh, uh, the concept of degrowth, et cetera. So many are pros and cons, you know, how do we achieve, like how to fight climate crisis? Can we still like benefit from it while we are trying to, you know, uh, put down the fire in our house, et cetera. But I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, the concept of such a macroeconomics as GDP is also like, uh, basically, is also man-made, right? Yeah. So everything that is man-made, you know, is always, uh, I'm, 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 I'm really reminded by something that is mentioned by Paul, Paul Romer in our talk. Uh, he, he said like, you know, basically his point was like, you know, I'm not really even sure that I'm right, you know, at this point, but what the main point is we have to be innovative. Innovative in our thinking, not only like technological, apolitical, you know, forms of products or tangible things, measurable, etc., marketable and, and everything, but also in, you know, in terms of like meanings and everything. I mean, it's, it's always, you know, like uh, if, if, if GDP is needed to measure things, okay, fine, but then how about the, uh, you know, the, the microeconomic level, how about the, uh, the people whose lives are being talked about, if we're talking about poor people, are we also talking with them? Are we also like, you know, uh, uh, letting them as a part of the discussions? Are we only, uh, maybe like, maybe some economists, maybe not here, but I don't know, maybe somewhere else, like uh, when we're talking about poverty, are you only using the ethic perspective of outsider looking in, or are you using the emic perspective of also insider looking in? Because sometimes there are realities, you know, People are complex, humanities are complex. That's what we learn from the earliest discussions, right? So we are like, we have uh, debates, differences, but then like, how do we, you know, how much effort do we put to capture those realities in the first place? So basically, that's why I think recently, economies are also like, you know, uh, not only about numbers, right? Recently, we, they have also integrated, oh, there's also such thing as social science. And it's <laughs> science. Oh, we need anthropology sometimes. We need sociology sometimes. We, we are not really above all, right? Sometimes you have to, get, you know, social scientists as well to actually, uh, you know, capture those uh, people who are left out of the reality. So I think that's the point, basically. It's not about agreeing, disagreeing about the GDP, but also about making sure that the people who are most marginalized and vulnerable, they can speak for themselves. I don't believe there's such thing as voiceless. You just don't hand over the mic to the right people and just find out how. So I think that's uh, from me. Yes, Len. More measures. We need more measures. GDP to blunt a tool. So um, I personally am not against the measurement of GDP. Um, I think it is an important measure. Uh, it's just not a measure of well-being itself, right? Um, and in all honesty, money is important, right? I mean, to organize something like this, of mm. course, we spend a lot of money, right? And uh, to bring up poor people, to give a voice to poor people, we need to invest in it, right? So um, I am not against the concept of GDP itself or aid or anything of, of that matter, uh, mm. for that matter. But um, I do think more importance should be given to other measures. Um, I, mean, I mean, this Human Development Index and there's a lot of other indices which do measure mm. other, co other concepts apart from just income, which I think should be focused a little bit more on. And um, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of... Um, constraints and issues that all these measures have. These are all just estimates and proxies of the reality, right? The Human Development Index, I believe, has uh, literacy 
and literacy in a lot of countries measured by asking them, can you write your name? And that's, I wouldn't call that a literate versus illiterate person, right? Um, so these are very subjective. So I think there are issues with all these measures, but these measures do give us a good idea of what's going on and up, uh, you know, very abstract level, sort of. OK, because we have such little time, constraints of, of resources all the time, I'm going to barrel us on very quickly onto the other topic that we were hoping to do, and that was this idea of literacy, of education. And one of the things that Paul Romeroso mentioned was that he said that work is school and school is work, and that one of the very great failings we have in our societies, particularly many, many perhaps in both developed and developing societies, is that we only see education taking place in school. And we never take into account that actually it also takes place in the workplace. Yep. Um, both of you have also done work on this. Is that true? We are too narrow in thinking of education as only being what takes place in school? So, so I think, you know, my reaction to that is, you know, I think what he says has a lot of truth in it, you know, thinking about work as school and school as work. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, in general, when, whenever we think of schooling, we're always trained to, you know, conditioned to think about, you know, formal schooling. I think most of us also recognize that, you know, formal schooling only brings you that far. And really, once you're in the workplace, mm -hmm. you know, it's, um, you know, it's the wild, wild west and it's, uh, you know, you, you have to pick things up on, on the go. And I think, you know, in some way, trying to also formalize that idea is, I think, something that we're moving toward, this idea that, you know, people are retiring at older ages, you know, um, the, the economy is changing drastically. You know, really, maybe there really shouldn't be a work is school, school is work kind of boundary even, but rather thinking about life as continuous schooling. I feel like, you know, maybe the Danes and the, the Scandinavian countries have already embraced this idea of lifelong learning earlier than, than we have. Um, but on the other I think there's immense potential, right? So I think, you know, NUS has really, uh, all the higher education institutions in Singapore have been pushed towards thinking about how to bring people back to school, whether it's in partnership with companies, you know, sort of doing it on the job and recognizing that you are learning skills there, or really coming back to the classroom and being like, hey, look, I need to learn something new. And, you know, is school the best place to educate myself? Um, maybe that's, that's the right place to go. So it's a life cycle thing. So Monica? I just have two, two points to make. Uh, I think one, I mean, similar to how we measure um, economic well-being, right? Um, like, I think what uh, we, we would like to achieve has to be reflected in how we assess, uh, you know, like for example, in this case, students. Uh, and I think uh, right now, uh, there's a lot of like, needs to rethink and to redesign this assessment frameworks, like how we assess students. How about no more exams? Oh, there would be, I think, yeah, maybe no more exams. Like Indonesia, uh, uh, we already abolished the national exams. And now it's more like school-based kind of like exams instead of like, you know, national exams. Um, but certainly, you know, there are like skills that are becoming more relevant in today's world than like before. For example, like metacognitive skills, you know, uh, critical thinking, interpersonal skills, and what Jessica said, like uh, uh, eagerness to to continue to to learn, right? Mm. So if we continue to like assess students in a way that we used to, I think you know we will get the outcome that we might not want or like might might not be relevant to today's world. Um, and just you know, my second point about education, I think in the future, I think we will see more and more like personalized learning. Uh, you know, AI will be able like to tell like individual students what to learn, what not to learn, what fits and what mm. doesn't fit to like individual students. Oh, I hope not. I hope that there will still be serendipity where we can find know, things ourselves. It seems, like, it seems like it's going that way. Okay. You know, uh, AI and algorithm. Okay. Lynn, I was, I was um, yes. back in the stage. You said I can, we can interject. Absolutely. And, uh, can I add, not interject, not against anything. But I think there is something, an elephant in the room that I think talking about work and school, I agree with Jess, it's not like a binary, right? It's like an ongoing process. But I think we need to, to, to talk about what they don't teach to you at schools, right? As a person who has only recently go to the labor force as well, it's not very as senior as <laughs> the other panelists. But I think what they don't teach you is actually reality, you know, bites, right? Reality bites, and when you go to the workplace, you have so many, especially social skills that you don't have. And this is what Jess also mentioned, like what you learn in life. It's like uh, skills that you get by interacting with people. But also one of the things is actually, I think, uh, the skill to also like, you know, negotiate for your work condition. 
Because I think recently there has been a rise in workers, especially young workers, uh, who actually are more aware of their rights. For example, I would like to tell you just a small story. Actually, in Indonesia, my nonprofit, uh, we... Oh, We'd love to, but unfortunately, we are running incredibly oh, late sorry. today. So, so my you just... know, you, Jian's going to be just be there, go and ask oh, him for okay. the story. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> All but right. Anyway, uh, my point, just my point yes. is, don't forget to voice out your rights. If you're not satisfied with your unpaid internship, if you're not satisfied with overwork and underpaid young people, especially medical students and everything, speak up, okay? Speak up. If you then well stand done. up for yourself, who will? Exactly. You and I speak that up, okay? I totally That's my point. So sorry. Thank you. No, no. That, that I, I think I totally agree with. As a journalist, speak up. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very sorry to have to wind this up. Can I do the very last thing, though? I know that Adam is going to come on stage and stop me. Would you like to just put up your hands again? Do you think it's worth substituting GDP with satisfaction index? Who would like to see the GDP substituted with the satisfaction index? Uh, they're way too practical. I'm an idealist. Let's go for satisfaction. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being on the panel today. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So sorry. Well, very much indeed. And I'm sorry to rush you. I really am. But people need their coffee. And there's a coffee break now, half an hour. Please, please be back here at 3.30 for the following session, which is on education, Jan, and they talk about what you were interested in. So please, see you soon. Welcome back. Uh, our next section is on education and the future of youth. And to set us off, I'm delighted to invite Anna de Adio from UNESCO, who you've met already, to come and give a short presentation on the Global Education Monitoring Report. Anna. Um, hi everyone, uh, you already saw me uh, before, okay, uh, now I'm starting very shortly with um, a presentation on the uh, report, the Global Education Monitoring Report. The Global Education Monitoring Report is um, a report that is uh, done uh, at UNESCO by an editorial independent team. Um, I lead the thematic part of the report, so I am head of the section on the thematic part. The report is the thematic and the monitoring part. And um, it has been why I wanted to present uh, here today, because uh, this year is uh, the 20th anniversary of the Global Education Monitoring Report. It is uh, 20 years. So, um, and uh, it's a very important report uh, because uh, it received the mandate uh, at the World Education Forum in 2015 to monitor uh, progress in education in the 2030 agenda and uh, um, the implementation of strategies to achieve SDG 4. And also uh, to hold all partners to account uh, to the commitments uh, of the agenda of Education 2030. And what is really interesting in, uh, about this commitment, this obligation, this task that we have is really about the fact that SDG 4, the Sustainable Development for on Education matters. And it matters because it speaks of many things. It speaks about uh, um, ensuring inclusive quality education for everyone and uh, also to promote lifelong learning and for all again. So it speaks about universality. It's a, a universal objective. It's every country that it should be involved in this uh, uh, commitment. Uh, it, uh, it talks about inclusion. So we heard from this morning, from the early beginning of this uh, uh, event today, talking about the need uh, not to leave anyone behind. And it speaks about intersectoriality. Um, we, as a Global Education Monitoring Report, we are much more than a report. So in addition to the global report, we, do, we produce a number of outputs. We produce a gender report, a regional report, and we have a, a set of uh, websites uh, that you can see here uh, that uh, discuss progress in SDG4, out of school rates, country profiles in different topics. Now. Um, 
SDG4 matters. SDG4 matters, as we say. Why? Because education is really something that transforms lives. It empowers people. It saves lives. Hmm? Uh, if uh, we can think about a uh, woman, but if we had the discussion this morning about climate change, uh, raising climate change awareness is also a way to save lives. It contributes to sustainable development. And uh, there are some figures here that you can really uh, bring forward and remember. And it reduces poverty. However, uh, and uh, I have two minutes and I finished, there are, uh, despite the enormous importance of uh, education, there are really deep inequalities between and within countries. Some figures that we have just released last week. 244 million of children, youth, adolescents are out of school now as I am speaking. Sub-Saharan Africa is the region where this number count, account for more than half of these figures. And at all level of education. Um, if we think about what happens during COVID pandemic, and we have seen the data that has been collected, we realize also that 40% of poor country did not target learner at risk during uh, the education response during COVID. And this, uh, this matter for the uh, dialogue we are having today is prolonged closures may have really huge impact on the career, educational employment career of the most vulnerable that may drop and not re-enter anymore. But there are also deep inequality in terms of access to technology, access uh, to internet, access to electricity, access to PC, to devices. And um, there are, again, uh, the inequalities are really deeper in low-income countries. You can see here some figures, for instance, among 20 to 24 years old, 98% of women and 90% of men in Chad, but 36% of women and 31% of men in Tunisia reporting never having used internet. And uh, there is also the issue of gender, so I'm just giving a little bit of food for thought. Uh, gender biases and gender stereotypes are very pervasive. And we have seen that even if girls outperform boys in learnings, they are not among the top performers in mathematics and science, and this is why very often is uh, the um, bias the legacy of uh, uh, social and cultural norms. And uh, this impact also to the extent to which boys and girls are aware about uh, uh, issues about climate change or other issues that are really important for the lives of uh, youth people, um, of young people. And uh, just to finish on this food for thought things, um, I would like to, to really highlight the fact that we are in huge need of education funding. Uh, we know that globally, uh, one in six families saves to pay school fees, uh, while 8% of families in low and middle income countries have to borrow money to pay for their children to go to school. And this is something that is very important where um, the non-state schools, private schools, may apply these huge fees that are a threat to equity in some extent. And still, aid to education is projected to fall. So, just to conclude, uh, there is the urgency, COVID has increased the urgency to enhance inclusion and to invest in education. And inclusion is really, and I would like to highlight that, is really about not leaving anyone behind. An inclusive learning environment is an environment that really ensures that everyone can thrive and succeed in education, and is an environment that, um, that value the potential of everyone, irrespective of the background abilities of every person. And uh, 
this, I will leave it here. It's very important to talk about the digital skills. Uh, there is uh, the basic ability to use digital schools is something that is going along with the green and will continue with the green uh, transformation, with transition to a green and sustainable, um, a sustainable growth. However, many countries do not pay uh, enough, um, enough uh, uh, attention to the issue of digital. Digital skills is not just empower and giving the skills. It's also taking a, account of, of everything that means safety, risk, privacy. And so it's also a, talking about uh, a different discourse and taking everyone on board and ensure the most disadvantaged are not left behind. So on that, uh, just the next GEM report will be on technology and education, and we will be very happy to hear from you about it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, you're joining our panel, so please take a seat. Um, Anna, please, if you'd like to sit there. And let me introduce the rest of the panel to join. You've met Anna. Um, please come up and uh, take your seats. We have Tegu D'Artanto, who's the um, Dean of the College of Economics and Business at the University of Indonesia. We have George Smoot, 2006 Nobel Laureate in Physics. We have Jackie Zhao, who's a MD PhD student at um, uh, Duke NUS College. Devashi Paliwell, hi, who is a medical student from the Australian National University and mo as our moderator, very pleased to introduce Joanne Roberts, who's the president of the Yale NUS College. Thank you all for being here. Um, Devashi and Jackie were part of the student group who met with Esther Duflo, economics laureate, for 90 minutes to discuss education before. And it was very interesting because your highly selected group of young people focus very much on what is wrong with the highly selective education system, particularly in Asia. So I look forward to hearing about it. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. I look forward to hearing about it too. Um, it's great to be here and to be here with this panel, especially. Um, this morning we had such an inspiring talk where we really heard about moving from, from children having needles to sew footballs to having pencils to go to school with. And I think that that notion of, you know, how do we clear a level field um, exactly as Anna said, so we can walk together and no one is left behind. And, and I think this is a great panel to talk about that. I think education, and especially much of the time when we talk about education, we talk about exactly that. How is it that we create, hopefully, a playing field, a level playing field for people to have opportunities and access? And today we're gonna share a few clips of that conversation, and, and um, I'm excited to hear the things that our panel thinks. Let us start with, with the first clip. Um, and um, this hi, is my name is Edwina. Uh, I'm an undergraduate student, and I'm currently residing in Canberra. So I be, when the pandemic hit, I saw the digital education as being an opportunity, a hopeful opportunity for us to actually equalize education, uh, especially in a country that is like big and with a lot of rural areas like Indonesia. But then, in fact, it actually widens the gap because people stop education. So actually, I, uh, my question is that how can we actually um, equalize educational opportunities given we have limited resources and like can digitalizing education really be a solution to this problem? So in my opinion, education cannot be done fully digitally. I think you want to think of the digital tools as complementing the, the, the basic structure of the school. And, and, and allowing the tailorization of experience that we already said is important. I think this picks up on a theme that came out in the minister's talk this morning, a kind of techno-optimism that perhaps many of us had, that education offered digitally would be a way of increasing access, increasing penetration into areas um, where it's more difficult. and. Um, the disruption of COVID, I think, has shared and, and taught us a lot of lessons. And I thought I'd, I'd maybe start with you, Tangu, and maybe you could tell us a little your views on, on what we've learned about technology education in the last few years. You answer. Okay. 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 Uh, thank you very I much. I wasn't sure it was me or him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you okay. got it. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes. Uh, 
at least the pandemic uh, 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 has uh, transformed our education, and pandemic has uh, created the opportunity uh, to our education system uh, to uh, delivery of the education becoming more more online. So by the online education is improve the, the opportunity to access of education. So I think it's based on our experience in our, our, our school that during the pandemic, we experienced the jumping of uh, uh, applicants, applicants of the graduate school student because the delivery is online. I think this is the good opportunity uh, during the pandemic, having the uh, uh, access, improving the access of the education. However, the pandemic also led to uh, diverse and widening learning losses due to the digital divide, uh, teacher roles, um, access to the high quality uh, teaching material at uh, local language, and also uh, many issues on, on, on especially on, on the digital divide. As the experience in, in Indonesia is very diverse country, in the early of the pandemics in the March 2020, only two out of ten and the poorest uh, uh, child uh, at the uh, poorest family having access on, on internet. So eight of them cannot participate in, in online education. But by a year, there is an increase. Eight, of, eight of, out of ten have access on internet. But the problem is there is no much uh, high quality uh, teaching material uh, for the uh, elementary school student. So the good material is coming from uh, English language material. But in Indonesia, in the elementary school, at the beginning of the first grade or second grade, the, the delivery language is not Bahasa Indonesia. They have to use the local language. So this is also the problem. That's why um, uh, the learning losses uh, during the pandemic will be having like the long lasting the, uh, the problem that this is will be uh, tackled, will be addressed uh, uh, now. So in the education system, we are in the education sector, we, we have like the call that double burdens, uh, learning crisis before the pandemics because the, we are improved the schooling, improved the access of basic education, but the learning is, is remain stagnant, remain low. And the second one is the issues of the learning losses. So we have to deal these two issues uh, how to prepare for, for the future of, of, of the youth or the young generations. Thank you very much. Wow, that's great. Clearly lots of challenges ahead. And what we saw in your report, Anna, it's clear that many places, um, it's hard to think that technology is going to be the solution when we have such a low rate of access and penetration and um, of, of digital tools. And perhaps, Devashi, do you want to share some of your, your thoughts and views? Definitely. So am I audible? Right. <laughs> yes. Um, can I just start by saying it's an absolute privilege to be on this panel with these in incredible, accomplished uh, members and such an audience. And yes, I would definitely like to take a talk, um, take in on um, the accessibility issue. So growing up in rural India, 17 years, um, I can speak from my first-hand experience. There's socioeconomic, socio-cultural, political barriers. But what's more exaggerating is um, gender stereotypes, the gender inequality. So male education is given uh, more sort of priority and more um, seen as, as a worthwhile investment than female education. And this is perpetuated by gender roles, so females being seen as um, homemakers, males being seen as the breadwinners, and then just building upon that, that creates an opportunity gap for uh, females more and more. And this this is on top of the already existing social uh, disparities, for example, access to poor uh, facilities and schools, infrastructures, uh, poor quality of teachers, and um, overcrowded housing. There's just environments which are not conducive for students to be able to study properly and um, access those resources and things. Um, so definitely female education, like quite a big issue. Um, why is it important? Because um, World Bank statistics suggest that every year of education, um, investment in, in female's education um, results in a 12% increase in her annual income. And following on from that, she, uh, females invest about 20% back into the community, the, the proportion back into the community from their, from their income. So, and this is beyond what they invest in their family, in their extended family, in their cells. This is talking about the community. So it has 
you know, um, advantages which can sort of ripple better health outcomes for the whole family. I think so, yeah. I have to say it's inspiring to think about how we, how we, improve, uh, how we improve access for women. Definitely. And uh, do you have some thoughts? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, and also for me, it's really a privilege to be here with you. Um, uh, so I think it's, it's very important what you said. Uh, COVID represent, has represented the opportunities, um, has opened education opportunities in the sense that uh, it has strengthened the investment of countries in the digital technology and especially online uh, connection methods. However, at the same time, I think it's, uh, it has represented, it still represents for many countries, a huge burden because the most disadvantaged are not there to study. Uh, in addition to learning losses, um, there are, of which we know yet very little because uh, it's very difficult to estimate because what COVID has, makes, has made also very difficult is data collection. So a lot of surveys are being delayed uh, because uh, they were suspending, uh, suspended during the COVID pandemic. But it's also that many people, and especially, especially those that were moving from a grade to uh, from lower secondary to upper secondary, drop out. So, and this is a really a question of uh, the, the most disadvantaged uh, and the uh, women, uh, in many cases, the girls uh, that uh, dropped out because uh, there is still this gender bias and stereotypes uh, that put women, uh, when there is a preference or choice to make, uh, in many countries it's still the men that go to school. And, uh, but in addition of this, there are, this, there are a lot of issues in relation to education, but there are also a lot of issues caused by interruption of education that have a huge bearing on the future life of this young woman and men. Because uh, interrupting education for many, especially in many low-income countries in Africa, it means increased child marriage increase early pregnancy, increase gender bias violence. There are issues that there are studies already showing that this is going on again. So education is important, not, not just for education itself, for what it brings to life, but also because uh, it's, a, it's a safe envi environment. So we need to think about education about school health, school nutrition, all this has been interrupted. That's why COVID pandemic has been so hugely uh, important for learning. And uh, we think that uh, we don't know much yet of uh, what's going on. Yeah, this is an unfortunate, as an economist would say, natural experiment that we're <laughs> yes. gonna have a lot of data from. Yeah. Um, no, I think, I think it's, it's, this is a really important topic. One other theme that I noticed in the discussion with Esther Duflo was on meritocracy, thinking about education in Asia. Mm -hmm. And maybe if we could cue up the second clip from Evangeline here in Singapore. Yes. I'm Evangeline from Singapore, and I'm a postgraduate student with the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. So I'd actually like to pose a question on whether um, do you think that the current education system um, in Southeast Asia actually violates meritocracy and the, the um, equity of opportunities among the students? So I don't think it violates meritocracy because I think the exams are pretty transparent and uh, well run and all that. and the you know, in a sense, compared to the American system where you, uh, there is less emphasis on the exam, but you need to have started violin at age three to have any chance to get into Harvard and uh, uh, volunteered in the right place and uh, so on. That's, I think, violate meritocracy much more because these systems are impossible to, to negotiate for someone who is not in the know. If the system uh, rewards skills that it doesn't teach and stuff that it doesn't do, then it's basically, uh, uh, that's a violation of meritocracy. The Asian system has the advantage of being quite clear about what you need to do to succeed. And there are disadvantages to that because of the teaching to the test that it leads to, uh, but it has the merit of being fair. 
Now, there is a second degree unfairness, which is the one we were describing, which is once the expectations are very clear, then you know the, ra the race is on and the families can organize themselves to uh, to you know, dope their children in, this, in, this, in these races. But if I had to choose a system, I think I would still prefer that. I think it's an interesting point of view because I think quite often, um, and maybe this is because I come from Canada, there's a little bit of, of looking down on some Asian systems. And I, I think this, this idea that it might be more equitable in some way, mm -hmm. I think is quite an interesting theme. Jackie, you've been through all of this. You've written the Gaokao and been through all of this experience. I was wondering, what's your take on, on meritocracy, mm. on teaching to the test, and, mm. and all of this, and what it means for Asia? Right, so a little bit of myself. So I grew up in China, and I took the Gaokao, which was the university entrance examination. Um, so basically, um, it was still widely regarded as the only way for families to improve their lives or change, um, or change the outcomes or change their socioeconomic status in China. Um, of course, you know, even in China, there's still a lot of reforms about education going on. Um, but if we look at the Singapore example, um, we know that the essence of meritocracy is that um, we select talents regardless of race, language, religion, or background. But there has to be an objective way of selecting talents, and that is by education. So then um, the problem becomes twofold. So one is whether people have universal access to education, which should be seen as a basic human right. And I'm sure um, Anna and Devashi has, have discussed about it um, quite, quite um, thoroughly. So um, like, like how can we ensure that, that uh, in the least developed um, areas in the world, we still have universal access to education regardless of gender or socioeconomic status. And there has to be a lot of things will, will need to be changed, like you know, how parents perceive education um, you know, compared to their short-term economic outcomes. You know, um, and, uh, but, but, so, so that's one fault. Um, the other fault is you know, in a system where it's fair, you know, you know, much like what, what Esther is talking about, um, then how can we make sure that people from the least um, the least privileged socioeconomic background can, can ascend um, to have an improved upward social mobility. Um, so then it, it, it relates to things like, you know, the ways of assessment. For example, um, if, if everyone needs to learn how to play violin to get into Harvard, then obviously, you know, those from the, the, the least privileged background can't even get into Harvard. Then that, that blocks the, the, the mobility in a sense. So, so that has to do with the, the assessment um, uh, and, and the design of our curricula, so to speak. Um, but, but of course, um, also, um, we need to think about, you know, how can we, um, you know, make the system um, more towards assessing a person as a whole, like holistic mm -hmm. education and assessment, mm -hmm. that's more important. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Deveshi. Yeah, Joanna, I'd like to add, just linking what Jackie said and what Anna brought up, is that because the education system is so meritocracy-based, it's all directed towards, and this came up in the pre-recorded discussion as well, that it's all, all based about just preparing for an exam, preparing for a test, getting good grades. And because it's designed this way and not more holistic, and there's a huge gap between students coming out of the school, completing their education, and the gap between are they ready for the job market? Mm -hmm. Do they have the necessary skills? And because of this gap, um, there usually comes this question of, in terms of female education, is it a worthwhile investment in her education versus should we get her married? So I'll just very briefly share a personal account where my extended family was faced with the question of um, investing in their young daughter's education, barely affordable, versus just getting them married um, with a large dowry into a more wealthier family. And the community advised them that it would be better to marry them in a wealthier family to promote social mobility for the whole family. So there's lots of complex um, yeah, factors that play into the yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I can add quickly another issue, I mean, we, we um, are just publishing in some next month uh, the regional report on non-state actors uh, in South Asia and uh, the phenomena of uh, non-state schools in uh, South Asia is very, very uh, spread, widespread. So, and uh, we looked into the regulations um, and uh, what uh, non-state school do to ensure 
equitable admissions, for instance, or equity and inclusion are satisfied. And we realize that most of the regulation on a global level really uh, focus on administrative requirements. So licensing uh, or lands or lands requirement. Very little, less than 9% of countries, and we have covered 211 uh, education systems, so all in the world, less than 9% have uh, a quota uh, looking at uh, disadvantage, uh, people or gender. So I think there is also, there are also an issue about, uh, uh, I'll say justice or um, equitable uh, admission and equity and inclusion really to think about uh, when we discuss uh, education at the global or regional level. Definitely. It's fantastic. It's really interesting. I think going back to something that Deveshi said, I think cues up our, our next video, which is about the role of education. Um, is it prepare you for a test or does it prepare you for life? And maybe we'll, we'll listen to that now. And that's Charlie from Vietnam. A trend in Asia in general that we don't really prepare children for life. We just teach them to do exams. And the education system in Asia is very different from the Western uh, education system. In Asia, I don't know for some reason why, uh, we value achievements above the skills of the students. I don't know that it's uh, that it's a cultural mindset as in something that I don't know is in Confucius and cannot be changed. Uh, I think it's a, it's a cultural mindset as in it's everybody in a society that is having the same type of views at a given point in time. But that's because they also res co respond to the same social pressure. So I, th I don't think it's culture in the sense of being, you know, deeply ingrained that, uh, uh, oh, my, ch my children will only have A pluses or I will be a failure. It is responding to what employer wants and what the school system rewards. George, perhaps I could ask you to respond to, the, to this clip. And uh... I have. I don't know how sacrilegious I can be, but I, yeah, I, I, will, uh, I will do that. And I actually have some experience in education um, and uh, actually seen a transition to where people actually do research in education and see how people learn. Okay, so I think the first question is, why are mostly Western but advanced countries' education systems beginning to fail? Hmm. Okay, and there's a reason for that. But the first question is, what's the purpose of education? Hmm. Now, if you look at it from a biological sense, it's to equip people to deal with the world more effectively and better, right? And so that used to mean preparing people to get a, an advanced education so they're well-equipped for a job. There is no job that I can think of that requires a college education that is likely to be here in 20 years. <coughs> Every one of them is going to be automated to some extent or whatever it is. And, and I disagree, with, I argue with people about this, but it's clear you could already do judges and you can certainly do doctors by now. You know, if you can do them, you can do pretty much everything, I mean, lawyers too. Mm -hmm. Lawyers are partly automated already. So the question is, how do you do that? So I wanna go back when I first started dealing with education projects and everything, I went to the education department and they just weren't doing what I considered education research. They were doing anecdotal stories. But when people started doing education research, it became very clear that lecturing was one of the most inefficient ways to transfer information to people, right? And, I mean, literally, you know, reading the textbook and working the problems was better. I'm sorry. I'm not being sacrilegious. This is actually agreed to now, right? But I as you go along- I appreciate it when the sage on the stage says this. Right, okay. <laughs> the, the next thing you go up to, there's several different levels of how you can learn stuff. It is clear that having hands-on, right? So there's a very good university in the United States that has a school of nursing, and they've made a fake hospital. Well, not a fake hospital. It's a real hospital, but it's a learning hospital where they're teaching people to deal with pregnant women having babies, right? And they put the nursing students in that situation right away. They're way more you know, motivated to learn how to <laughs> birth babies, right? And <laughs> to take, and, but the other thing that's very useful to get people is have the students teach their fellow students. 
when you got to teach something, you learn. You know, we used to have a joke. The first time a teacher teaches the course, nobody learns. Right? <laughs> the second time, he learns. <laughs> and then finally, the students learn. Right? It, teaching makes you learn stuff. It's like having your hands on. It makes, makes you do that. And so very early on, many years ago, I would go to classrooms and give a lecture. And I thought, this is really inefficient. Right? You know, it's inspiring to students. There's a scientist who came into the classroom. Right? I found my idea was you take teachers and send them to a teacher's academy and have them learn the science and get excited and give them a lot of material so they can use it in their classroom. When I set up some teacher's academies and I always got, in the, in the early days when I finally designed it, got so that there were three or four truly outstanding students for the teachers to work with and they would think, oh, this works, this technique works. I'm great, look at how the students mastered it. Now, if you're putting ingenious students in, teachers were gonna be successful, right? It's, it's the kind of thing. And so we did that and we invented a thing called Hands-On Universe where we, we have an automated telescope where people in high schools can, can log on and look at parts of the sky. We've had them discover comets, we've had them discover everything like that and so forth. And then one of the things we did was we, we got contacted through other things I was doing, a teacher in Kenya. It turns out at that time, there were no high school teachers of science in Kenya. Mm -hmm. So we got her and a couple of friends and made them master teachers by taking the course and sent them back to Kenya and did that. And then I started, so we have hands-on universe in, in Berkeley. There's one that runs in Portugal. There's a different one in France, but every country has these different restrictions on what you can do with teachers. Teachers are horribly, over-constrained in the Western developed stuff. And uh, I started one in, in uh, South Korea, and the South Koreans started out the way we were doing this stuff, you know, providing material, round-the-clock coverage. It was, mm -hmm. the idea was the sun never sets on the British Empire. And, and uh, right, they got excited about it, and they started taking teachers to Kenya every year, right? And they would build, go to villages that didn't have schools, and they would build a school, right? because there wasn't even a school. And that's a long, slow way to do things, but that's what they were excited about and could raise money for. It's, it's very different. What you're facing in different countries is very different. In, in, the, in the advanced societies, teachers are over-constrained. Teachers want to teach people stuff because they were inspired by a teacher when they were young. And they go and they find out the course materials that way. You know, I convinced the French to have cosmology in the high school curriculum. I had to set up a teacher's academy to teach teachers how to teach cosmology and provide them material, yes. right? Because the poor teachers weren't allowed time off to, to do that. And they have, have government approval to go to that academy. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. we can't do it on French holidays or it's just whatever. So you have to ask yourself, what are we educating people for? Mm -hmm. We need to think about that very carefully. Now, there are these great secondary goals where when you, when you teach young women in poor countries, they, they don't get married yet, they get to, and, and they can do the stuff. And I had this wonderful experience in Dubai when I met these young women. I couldn't shake their hand because they're not allowed to touch men, but I was, I was meeting them. And they were the ones that were working hard and going to school. And they were very straightforward. They, they were, when they got married, they were gonna have a contract that they could still have their own business. And they had an education, some were in IT. One of them had a little company. They were, it's a, so you have to think, what is the real purpose of education versus what is the multi-purpose that are putting on there? Is it babysitting so that kids are out of school? Or are you actually trying to get them to deal with the world? And you're in a situation now where you can teach people with virtual reality or with avatar teachers. There's all these possibilities. You know, I was worried the last few years that they would get smart enough to realize you don't need all of these professors teaching in quantum mechanics, all these low level courses. You just need one set of good lecturers and they can put their stuff online and, and, and you don't need to do that. And I thought, oh my God, they'll fire me from my job. You know? <laughs> but the fact is they never got to it. The whole system is not willing to change. Yeah, no, I yeah. think- Was I that religious enough? <laughs> I, I, I think it's, it's a great it's a great sum up of everything, and it it's been interesting to me because I, I worried about that too. And it was amazing how keen students were to get back in the classroom with real with real teachers in a way. Um, we're, we're no, getting... it's the human interaction is very important. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you can go back and look at Socrates in the first university or whatever yeah. where the people teach. 
that was a skilled teacher, you know? Not every teacher is a skilled teacher. A lot of teachers need a lot of support in order to be able to do that. They're not paid very much. They're over-constrained about what they do. It's not a surprise. It doesn't work so well, right? It's true. Well, let me, let me, uh, we only have a few minutes left and maybe we'll do, give each of our other four panelists a chance. Let me quickly switch to a very skilled and innovative um, teacher and administrator. Tegan, what are your final takeaways or, or thoughts? Yeah, I think so. Uh, um, before the pandemic that we, we deal with the learning uh, crisis that um, is schooling but not learning, this is our problem. Um, in the Southeast Asia, uh, more than half of the eight years, uh, stu uh, eight year grade student uh, uh, do not have a numerical literacy. But this is uh, in the issues of the learning crisis is uh, coupled with the learning losses. Uh, during the pandemic, this is, will be the great problem uh, that we have to deal with uh, in, in Southeast Asia. But the problem, as I mentioned uh, by Anna, there is this difficulties to, to measure the learning losses itself. So we have to, to measure it and then we, we have to take our action in appropriate which level, for example, elementary school or junior school or even in, in senior upper school. Uh, so the difference uh, learning losses to need the difference uh, intervention. So this is uh, that we, we have to deal with in, in uh, Asia Pacific actually, maybe in worldwide also. Mm, yes. And the other thing maybe I, I would like to add the, the issues of the education that uh, yes, in, 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 in Asia, the style is that we, we, we go to school to, to prefer of, of the exam. And then in school, in school it's just to get uh, the, the place for exam, not for, for, for place for learning. So uh, we have to little bit shift the, our, our mindset that the, the school or our education should be beyond the, the exam. Or for myself, is the, the education should be uh, teach uh, uh, people or students uh, being a human. I think this is a uh, how to be a human that we need uh, uh, skill to, to tackle the problem, skill to, to, to be resilient, skill to work with others, skill to, um, uh, to make the work better, and lastly, uh, skill to, uh, to have a societal impact. I think this is uh, the important skill, but how to do, I think uh, this is a challenge for, for us to, to deal with. Thank you very much. Um, just the concluding word. So I think that what is really important and is uh, to try to bridge the gap. And once again, I already said it during the panel on climate change between knowledge and values, attitudes and behavior. And this means that this uh, these uh, things cannot happen, cannot happen just in schools. This is an entire work of the entire community uh, to work really uh, for this to happen, to make inclusion a reality, really to value the potential of everyone. And to, so we see, for instance, that digital skills in many cases are learned outside schools. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about safety, privacy issues, or uh, issue of media, social media literacy, <coughs> these are not competencies that some, someone get in school. So there is also um, a way to think about the curricula and uh, to bring in the curricula ways uh, to form uh, behaviors and to, to enhance uh, collective action on these, uh, on these uh, subjects. Diversity. Yeah, so <clears throat> just following from the incredible talks that George mm -hmm. did this morning and mm -hmm. also the yes. minister, um, it's amazing to see how many, uh, how rapidly the world is advancing with space and science and all of the areas. And it's both exciting as well as scary to see that the world is going to be quite different in five years' time. And so as a youth, I would want my education that equips me to be able to learn versus also unlearn. Mm -hmm to diversify my skill set, to be able to ask the right questions, to be able to challenge the status mm. quo and, and the things that we take for granted. So I wish I was <coughs> equipped with all those skills to be really prepared. And in terms of the very briefly touch on the solutions that Tegu said, it's a very complex, uh, complex question, but just talking at a very abstract level, one of the solutions just targeted approaches and design thinking process 
different countries, as George mentioned, different countries, students in different countries, different needs, different cultural contexts, different socioeconomic problems and things. So design thinking, targeted approaches um, for, to, to meet the needs of those yeah, relations. Thank you. Jackie, a last word? Yeah, so um, I think the way that we design education would really shape the future that we want together. So, you know, from starting from the way that we envision our education, you know, um, like what Prof. Smoot said, um, fundamentally it's a way to equip everyone with the skills to survive in different conditions. Um, to, to prosper. Yeah, to prosper, yeah. Um, you know, a, apart, from, apart from the fact Not that, you know, survive. it carries some more social, social functions as to selecting talents for, for other roles, for example. And then, so then it comes to how we design the curriculum and, and assessment or the way to execute um, education, like, like access to technology or, or um, the, the way that, 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 we, that we teach students instead of, you know, pure uh, lecture base or rote memorization to, to more holistic um, ways of, of, of educating people. And then finally, as to, um, you know, how we fit different people into the right places um, based on the educational outcome. So I think the whole uh, the, the whole education streamline mm. actually ties very well with, with mm. different aspects of our society. Thank you all. I have to say that I think I could spend the entire afternoon mm -hmm. with this panel that we have so many things to talk about. Access and inclusion, about how we face a future that will definitely um, require more resilience and more adaptability. Mm -hmm. And I feel confident when we have uh, youth like this with us that, that we're on the right path. Thank you very much. To our Thank panel. you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And thank you, thank you, John. And uh, just to allow you to reset yourselves a little before the next panel, we have the Andante from Haydn's London Trio, number one. Thank you.
Thank you very much indeed. So our next panel is on health after the pandemic. And for this panel, the young people from around Asia Pacific met with Maybrit Moser, uh, a Nobel laureate in medicine. And I, th I don't know if we have our panel quite ready yet. I'm waiting for them to assemble. I think they're swapping microphones. So what we might do now is to just play a short clip of Maybrit Moser reflecting on the topic of health uh, after the pandemic. If that's possible. Can we play the My Brit Moser clip? No, can't. No My Brit Moser clip. OK, in that case, I should invite my panel on stage, please. Now you're ready? Great. So if you all join me, then I shall introduce you. Why, why are you there? Sally, why don't you go there? Yeah, there. Okay, that's fine. You can just sit like this. Yes. So, um, Dame Sally Davis is the president of Trinity College, Cambridge. George Smoot, you've already met, 2006 Nobel Laureate in Physics. Professor Kenneth Mack is director of medical services at the Singapore Ministry of Health. Now, you're going to challenge me. Tharun Tharumin Nathan. Yeah. But I've got, I got that a bit wrong. I'm sorry is a student, a medical student from the National University of Singapore. And Zani Lin Kyor is a public health worker from Myanmar. The moderator for this panel is Wai Wai Tio, who's Dean of the School of Public Health here at the National University of Singapore. I should have been at the end. I'm not sure that we can have I see that. the vibrant Moser clip. No, it doesn't work. So just really over to you, well. please yeah. go ahead. Thank you very much, Adam. And good afternoon, everyone. So. It's a real privilege to be moderating this panel, and I know that we are very short on time, so I wouldn't, uh, I would save much on the pleasantries. But I thought the topic on health after the pandemic, it's a very important one, particularly if we look at some of the key lessons that we ought to have learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. And I would perhaps just mention three items, well, three lessons that I have learned from the pandemic, and then we could perhaps discuss from there. Because what is quite clear is that for the longest time, we have always considered infectious diseases to be distinct from chronic conditions like diabetes, hypertension, what we collectively call non-communicable diseases. But COVID-19 has clearly highlighted the intersection of both conditions because people with chronic conditions were more likely to bear the worst of a COVID-19 infection. So I think there is going to be this rebranding around how we look at communicable diseases and NCDs, conditions like diabetes, hypertension, cancers, because when someone has diabetes, it's obese, and it's now having COVID-19, that person is much more likely to suffer from severe disease or even deaths. So that's lesson number one. And the lesson number two is that governments and global public health leaders worldwide have been very quick to say, never again will we expose the world to the vulnerabilities of a, a pandemic such as COVID-19. But I think if we look very carefully at what this statement of never again entails, the question really is, are we truly prepared to live up to this statement of never again? And I would like to end off with the last lesson, which is really around some of the challenges that we've seen in terms of healthcare services delivery, primary care services, vaccines, acquiring vaccines, delivering vaccines, were always there before COVID-19 came about. And if we now think that because of COVID-19, the world is going to change, clearly, what has been the driver? And do we really have the ability to live up to this statement of changing even primary care services where for the longest time they have not been able to address simple childhood maternal child issues around hygiene, around vaccinations, around uh, uh, antenatal care. So with that, that's just my very quick introduction to the statement of health 
after the pandemic in a world that we want together. And I think at this point in time, I would like to ask for the clip by Mohammad Faruqi, really, on what has been discussed previously. Could I have the clip? Hi, my name is Faruqi. I'm a medical student from Universitas Indonesia. I want to focus on what the inequality in our healthcare system, but in a global perspective. So I would, it is really interesting that we could hear that some countries are advancing forward uh, towards their healthcare system, towards their innovation, their technologies. But we have also some developing countries and underdeveloped countries which aren't able to catch up with it. So uh, this, is, this is, of course, extremely important. Um, as you say, um, uh, during the pandemic, we suddenly saw that even the rich countries can't protect themselves and be so selfish that uh, we typically are. Because uh, even in a, a remote country as Norway, we got the new uh, versions of the, the virus all the time, and it was so fast. So, perhaps first to Sally then, given you're on my left. And I think we have seen many well-resourced countries worldwide actually respond in a way that they were very quick to prioritize and ring fence resources to protect themselves during COVID-19. And in line with the theme of the future that we want, what hope do you think we truly have for countries, especially low and middle income countries, to truly achieve this aspiration of health equity? Well, I am a glass half full person and I always have hope, but I think we're a long way off where we need to be. And I'd like to start from the fact that at least in my country and many other countries, we have health systems which are actually illness systems. We treat illness. And if you look at the results you were talking about and the equity issues, we have to prevent ill health so that we don't get this syndemic of the coming together of chronic diseases related to poor lifestyles, poverty, and many other things with the infectious diseases. So we really need to move away from having just treating illness services to much broader services. And that necessitates us looking not only at the social drivers of health, but actually the commercial drivers of health. And how are we, as society interacting with businesses who make money out of ill health, um, whether it's alcohol or sugar or lack of exercise because we're going in cars or whatever. So there's a whole spread of things that we could talk about there and I do think people need to think about. When you get onto equity of access to innovation, it's another set of things. Um, and of course, politicians see their votes related to protecting their own people without understanding that without everyone being safe, no one's safe. So there's a big education needed. But then we have to look at how manufacturing is done, because if it's done more broadly, then actually they will be available more broadly, the innovations. So rather than wrap it on, I'll stop there, but I've opened a few boxes for you. Thank you very much, Sally. And, and with those boxes that you opened, I perhaps move over to Kenneth because <laughs> Kenneth, in your capacity as the Director for Medical Services in Singapore, you had your hands very full during the past two and a half years. <laughs> right now it looks empty because I think we're in a very good state. All of us are going pretty much maskless and without many restrictions. But I think in your opinion, what are some of the challenges that, can be, that will be posed because of this health inequity, and what roles do you think Singapore could play in this space? Yeah. Well, I'll start off by saying that, uh, that in many healthcare systems, if not all healthcare systems, there is an element of inequity that's actually present. That's either in, in terms of identifying at-risk populations that do require health services, support uh, in, in, uh, in incre improving their state of health, in terms of getting access to care, uh, access to treatments. Uh, so th there is uh, an element of inequity that takes place in all countries. COVID has brought things to the fore 
accentuated some of these issues. Uh, and because of uh, competition for resources, uh, and, and, and given that the hospitals were full with uh, looking after COVID patients, many patients with non-communicable chronic diseases would be then left at home, there would have been uh, less optimal care that would have been provided to them. So in all our countries, I would not uh, be surprised if life expectancy has, uh, statistics have changed, it's gone, gone down, uh, excess mortality figures would have come up, and all in relation to uh, managing this communicable disease over two and a half, nearly three years now. Uh, and, and if we look at, uh, at, uh, at uh, uh, even in Singapore, uh, COVID has allowed us to identify uh, hidden populations that hitherto we didn't re recognize were populations in need for interventions, for, 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 for treatment, for screening, uh, whether it's the migrant worker population that is in Singapore, whether it's hidden populations of seniors that as a result of immobility and other physical challenges would not normally be able to get out of their homes and seek care. Uh, COVID has brought uh, these to our attention and it's certainly the case where uh, uh, these issues of inequity have, 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 have come up. And the challenge then is now, particularly as numbers come down, we are able to free some bandwidth to, towards moving away from dealing with communicable diseases towards dealing with more important issues affecting the state of health of our population. We have now to think about reprioritizing what our agenda is and looking towards addressing these inequities, dealing with these hidden populations. But like Sally, I, I, I am a little bit more of an optimist because COVID has also uh, uh, seen us deal with innovative solutions to challenges that we face. The value of partnerships was never uh, so, so much in the fall as in relation to the last three years. And that included uh, partnerships between hospitals and primary care with community providers, uh, with public and private institutions coming together, with those uh, involved in direct care and those involved in research and innovation, all coming together to, to look at improving access to tests, to diagnostics, to treatments, to vaccines. And it does uh, 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 lay out that potential that moving forward, if we are mindful and we're determined to deal with these inequities, we can do something very positive through synergistic cooperation and partnerships that come to bear. So it is a problem. It's a stark problem brought to the fore by COVID. But I see the potential that we have now a greater leverage on resources to deal with this issue. Thanks very much, Kenneth. So I, th I think Singapore is in a, in a very privileged position given our stabi stability and in a way, a relative wealth to handle. And I think this is where I want to shift the lens rather quickly to Zani. Because Zani, coming from Myanmar, 2020 was a very difficult year for many people living in Myanmar. It's not just COVID-19, you had the coup that happened. And we all know that even for COVID-19 with a, a well-functioning government, where the health deliveries, health services delivery system is in place, there were a lot of challenges that governments were faced with. For Myanmar, you had a coup, and that was a government in transition. There were a lot of challenges that were introduced by that. The NGOs were less able, capable to be functioning within that space. Community efforts pretty much dried up as well. Zani, could you perhaps address a little bit, and how do you see this prospect of health equity, especially from the lens that you're one of the young leaders talking about the future that you would want? Thank you. So let me start by saying that like, when you talk about uh, equity, there are like vertical equity and horizontal equity. I'm not, I'm not going to bore everyone with those kind of technical terms. But for me, coming from the conflict-prone country where health insurance is virtually non-existent and there's no sa social safety net of any kind in Myanmar, uh, and only around 2% of the population is covered through social security board uh, kind of mechanism, we face a lot of challenges. But I would like to also take a step back and, and think about a little bit more about, about the global approach in, from, in equity. You know, 80% uh, of, of the healthcare spending is spent in the high income country, but the disease burden is uh, mostly in the uh, sub-Saharan Africa and in low-income countries. So I would like to also shift the discussion from the perspective that how can we divert more resources into uh, low-income countries in an effective way, in an efficient way. So those are the challenges that we face from the global perspective. From the local perspective, uh, there are tremendous challenges. Without peace and I, the 
the lady in my country, the state councillor, used to say, everything falls under the political umbrella. So uh, without peace, uh, creating a sort of that kind of social safety net to make sure that people are not left, be left behind. In Myanmar, according to the 2018 survey, 1.3 million people are driven into po poverty every year because of the healthcare costs. We need to prevent that. So, uh, in summary, we need to divert a lot of the resources from the high-income country and to, towards the low-income country so that those resources are used effectively and efficiently. I think this is really where some of the aid agencies worldwide, the official assist development assistance really comes in, and, and particularly for governments in transitions, addressing vulnerable and displaced populations. Now, I think one of the, as we start to talk about health after pandemic, one of the key elements of change has been the use of technology, not just in well-resourced countries, but even in uh, poorly resourced or, or low and middle income countries, they were relying a lot on the use of technology as a way to make up for some of the, the, the missed opportunities in healthcare services delivery. Now, when we start to think about the use of technology, we have the technology for surveillance, which is how we try to prepare, manage, and prevent future pandemics. We also have the technology on telehealth, so that it seems to be a very ripe space for discussion. And I think this is also a space where our young leaders had a discussion with uh, our Nobel laureate, Maybrit. So perhaps I could call for the second video by Denzel Chong. So my name's Denzel, I'm a medical student calling in from uh, New Zealand and in response to um, what James actually mentioned about the efficiency of the healthcare system. And, you know, I understand that in improving efficiency, you get a lot of benefits as far as substantially improving the availability of healthcare. But, you know, I want to raise the question about whether there is actually an upper limit to pursuing efficiency in healthcare, where, you know, where maybe we need to look at it a little bit differently to other economic and industrial areas where there's only so many patients, you know, that a doctor can see aided by automation before you get negative returns. My feeling is that it's important to be a human being and to be there and to get an alliance to your patient. And just this alliance by itself is helping the health of the patient. And so I think there is an upper limit and I think it's an S-curve. So it's an asymptote. And, but when we reach this uh, asymptote, I don't know. And again, it, it also, of course, depends on what type of problem there is. So it seems like both Denzel and Maybrit have been a glass half empty people because they were talking about the limitations of technology. And I think this is where I would like to come to George because <laughs> I think when it comes to technology, Denzel Maybrit talk about there's a limit to efficiency and yet numerous health systems around the world are actually pivoting towards the, the greater use of technology, especially as I mentioned earlier on, tech, telehealth and mobile apps aided by artificial intelligence. So what are your views, especially coming from a physics standpoint? Okay, and this, I have some insight because one of the things that I have done since I got to know Brian was take where I used to be consulting with people to consulting in healthcare, and I've seen a lot of the advances. So let me first say, I'm really actually impressed how the world handled COVID, even though there were many mistakes and it ended exposed a lot of fault, bad seams in the healthcare system and everything. I'm very optimistic about the future of healthcare and this, the COVID was actually an example of how things are improving, whereas I'm pessimistic about education. And the reason for that is there's tremendous resistance in the education fields to what I call the digitization of the world, right? The fact that we're able to do things with digital computers, you know, and, and artificial intelligence and so forth in a lot of areas. Medicine 
has advances on many fronts. The fact now is artificial, there are five different companies that have produced artificial doctors who pass the, the, the exams better than, with a score higher than 85% of human doctors. And you can retrain them in a week, okay? But there's research going on in scientific, you, there's new machines that let you look and do things, you know, uh, the fact is we don't have to cut a person open to see what's inside of them. We have tools to do that. You can do surgery where you run little tiny things up through their veins. And there's, it's incredible. I said, I went to an operation in a hospital and the technicians were sitting, or the nurses or whatever, they were sitting outside looking at the screens. The patient was in there on the table and there was one doctor in there guiding the, the things in until they were doing a heart stent. And, and, and I mean, it's stunning because there's no big hole cutting open. You're just gonna pull the wires back out and he's gonna get cured very quickly, right? It's a, so the advances by digitization and micro, the being able to do micro technology, or it should be nanotechnology, but we're still in micro. Those advances allow stuff to go quickly. So we got vaccine, we got tests and vaccines in a relatively short time. Think about what happened in 1918. Think about how much better, you know, people were stopped. Still six million or seven million people have died from it. It's not such a good thing, but think of what it would have been if we were still in 1918 technologies. And so I think there is just incredible advance. We're, we're seeing the sweep of the technology and the health medicine, right? And medicine used to treat illness, now we're going to be treating health or we're going to treat illness in a much different way. I mean, that's why I, I commend Singapore about having the stem cell, you know, umbilical cord stem cells. I, I also advise all of you guys, because you're too old for that, you should get your T cells done when you're in the 30s and get them frozen too, right? And it's, you know, it's going to be stuff. You realize now 70s in a, in a place like Singapore, 77 or 80 percent of diseases are not caused by biological agents. They're caused by your body, right? Having failures or environmental stuff. The nature of medicine is going to change a lot. People are going to continue to live longer, even though we've seen a decrease in life expectancy during this time period. The people who didn't get the, got the vaccines and didn't get the disease are going to live longer. And we want to have that happen. Now, what we've realized is we've got to be able to spread that technology into poorer countries. And Africa is a basket case, again, in this situation. Um, but the fact is, we can send HIV drugs now that people in Africa can use, whereas, you know, 30 years ago, they, there were whole villages where, you know, they were full of, of orphans because their parents had died from HIV. It's just, things are changing. And you know, things are actually getting better in healthcare in spite of the tragedy we just went through. And so I'm really optimistic about healthcare. <laughs> so that's but we've got to sweep, we've got to learn, people looking for a good future, got to learn to help increase the digitization. You really shouldn't be having a doctor who's an AI thing, unless you can get one of the very top doctors in the world, but that they should be consulting for the bad cases. The AI should be handling, the, and they'll be doing better, and you can update them. So that's a very optimistic answer. <laughs> I would like... Yeah, isn't the, that surprising for me, huh? <laughs> but I would like the chief medical officer, the, the from, former. <laughs> former chief medical officer, and now governing Trinity College in yeah, Cambridge. If she wants to argue, it's more entertaining. <laughs> um, well, I was going to start by pointing out that in 1918, of course, people didn't die of mm -hmm. flu, they died of bacterial infection as a result of flu and didn't have antibiotics. We have antibiotics now, but resistance, particularly in poor countries, yeah. is going up and up. I, I, I and believe we're going to fix problem. that problem. But well, yeah. I'm one of the world experts on it, and we're far off it. Uh, of course. <laughs> it's a tough problem. It's a tough problem. It needs more than you. The other side I wanted to bring in was actually, you can see why I was chief medical officer, was actually that you're thinking about one part of health which is probably the physical part, but there are four aspects mm -hmm. to health. And I think that the video brought that in. There's physical, there's mental, there's social and spiritual. Right. And I do 
agree that I think digitalization and AI, and I could give examples, are taking us forward on the physical. They can help with lifestyle and some of the prevention. Uh, and indeed, we've done randomized controlled trials of cognitive behavioral therapy using telephones. But I still think there is a, we need to look at health as a whole. Thank you, Dan, Sally. <laughs> the issue about health is that I must always emphasize that it's never just about the medical solutions, but it's also the cost because governments always have to balance that. And at this point in time, I want to come back to Tarun because you are a year free medical student. So you are one that is full of hope, at least for how <laughs> health, public health and clinical healthcare is heading in the future. Some comments from you on the use of digitizations and AI. So I feel like when you talk about health, right, there are three layers of prevention. Primary prevention, which is education. Secondary prevention, which is like screening. And tertiary prevention, which is basically when someone who's sick comes into the hospital. I'll stop you there. It's fantastic hearing a medical student talk about the three types of prevention that it's very much the foundation of public health. Over back. But education's no use if it doesn't get action. Oh, yes. Very good. <laughs> back to you, Tharun. <laughs> So yeah, like tertiary prevention is when someone who's sick comes into a hospital and we treat them. And technology has a role to play in all of these. For example, right, when you talk about primary prevention, things like social media, Instagram, all of them can help educate the public. And a lot of the population right now is youth and they don't communicate via newspapers, they talk via social media. And thus we can tap on these avenues. And this itself is a form of technology. And what I do see is when we talk about technology and healthcare, a lot of people think it's like, you know, AI for using for diagnosis and stuff like that, but not really. Simple things like digitization of medical records, um, using automated machines to bring stuff from level seven of a hospital to level one of a hospital. All of this is technology. And we can tap on, we can tap on all of these creative avenues. So I recently worked on a project which involves using AI to tackle a wide variety of problems. Uh, one team was working on things like diagnosing brain tumors and one team was working on optimizing queue for medical clinics so there are a lot of things we can achieve using technology and what this serves to do is effectively reduce the stress on the most important healthcare resource that is the doctors themselves as well as the other allied health professionals with the population becoming an aging population the burden on healthcare workers is going to increase technology can reduce the strain on them and in turn, this will help improve the quality of care being delivered. So I feel technology is super critical and we're just skimming the surface of what is unlimited potentials. Thank you. Thank you, Tarun. Can I come in yes. and uh, mm -hmm. just want to perhaps make some comments as well. Um, we've seen technology being used in many different aspects of healthcare and, and, and it has come to the fore, particularly in the last three years in relation to managing COVID. And I've seen technology applied in several different, uh, with several different themes. The first of which is, is in terms of care substitution, care displacement, uh, particularly where resources are lean in certain areas, manpower challenges that we have. We attempt to use uh, technology as a means of trying to overcome these challenges that we have. Then we have seen uh, technology being used to uh, change the care model that we have, uh, particularly with the view towards improving outcomes or reducing harm. And that may be uh, in various ways. Uh, 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 going into precision medicine, uh, uh, Dame Sally Davis, uh, when she was chief medical officer, was a very strong proponent for, for gene banking, uh, for, for the adoption of national precision health uh, strategies. These are important because they bring technology to the fore and allow us perhaps to tap the potential of looking at individualized treatments that may improve outcomes ultimately downstream as well. We've seen also technology being used in many other ways. But one uh, important enabler that we must uh, not uh, forget is technology has opened up windows in how we use data. And to some extent, George has alluded to this, because uh, uh, for the first time, technology makes data highly visible and highly transferable, highly portable, and allows now for the rich uh, uh, opportunities to analyze the data and bring fresh new insights to how we deliver health, whether it's in identifying at-risk groups that we want to uh, prioritize for interventions, whether it's in terms of identifying new strategies to deal with screening, diagnosis, treatments, uh, or uh, in fact, uh, uh, identifying how well we're doing in our journey towards a better health at a local level with a doctor in his clinic, at a community level, looking at 
how we reach out to populations in the community at hospital levels and at national systems levels. So I think technology is something that is, is, is something we underplay, underestimate, but, in, but it in fact has allowed us to open up new vistas of how we think health is going to be uh, envisaged in the future and how healthcare is going to be delivered in the future as well. Thanks very much, Kenneth. And I thought that's a very good time, a good ending for the, this session, because I think we started off talking about health after pandemic. It's you guys. Sally, talk about water. the antimicrobial resistance being one of the biggest it's problems that is big going to face it the is. health of yeah. the world coming up. And actually, there, from, from COVID-19, we should be able to see now that the technical solutions, whether it is from the basic science, the life sciences, the medical solutions, designing new antibiotics, is just one small piece of a much bigger and more complicated puzzle. Designing therapeutics and designing vaccines did not just simply solve the problems for COVID-19. There were social problems, there were cultural issues, behavioral issues, economic pressures, and of course, the political challenges that underpin a problem like COVID-19. And I hope with the pandemic, more governments, more health leaders, more chief medical officers, directors of medical services, Nobel laureates, will start to really understand this fact that health, it's beyond just technical solutions, just beyond economic solutions, but includes elements of politics, social, cultural, and more importantly, the behavioral understanding of how individuals will respond during a crisis when you ask people to wear masks, when you ask people you to come forward for their vaccines, share? even when it's freely delivered to them. The so with that, I hope all of us, especially the young leaders, Zani and Tarun, and young leaders, young students here today, will continue to aspire and to dream for the world, especially in a, in a, in a world after COVID-19. So with that, thank you very much, my distinguished panelists, and to all of you for spending this afternoon with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that energetic and fascinating panel. Thank you. So now we do get to hear some Fritz Kreisler, uh, the Liebes Light. Uh, and once again, please um, uh, turn your attention to Georgi Moroz, Shezod Abdiev, and Begzod Oblayoro.
Thank you very much indeed. And how appropriate that we should now step into a session called The Pursuit of Happiness. Um, as our panel get their microphones on, having got them from the last panel, let's start with a video. Um, in this case, um, uh, the young students from around Asia, the Asia Pacific re region met with economics, 2015 economics laureate uh, Angus Deaton, and he has worked extensively on happiness, and so he gave us his thoughts on the theme of happiness. Happiness is one of these topics that is of interest outside of economics, um, though it's actually been neglected perhaps for the last 50 years by psychologists, um, by philosophers, um, and by sociologists, by all the sort of people who might. And, but there's been quite an upsurge of interest. I come at this from an economist perspective. And one of the things that is perhaps me worth saying is I think these happiness measures, which we've all become very interested in, are very useful. But I'm also quite ambivalent about it. So my attitude is I'm not going to try to sell you these as the solution um, to everything. So I have just a couple of maybe six or eight very quick bullet points here. One is that happiness or um, life evaluation, which is a little bit different, measures are responsive to much more than just money. So if you have more money, you tend to say more, you're better off on these scales, but they're responsive to other things. Now that's a very good thing for economists because economists are sort of obsessed with money. Right? All they care about is money and they think you're better off if you have more money. And if you don't have less money, you're fine. And you know, that doesn't do a very good job for a lot of things. Um, and happiness is sensitive to changes in people's lives um, that are not just to do with money, like marriage, for instance, divorce. Um, but even in the economics domain, they're very sensitive to unemployment. And that's been a really important finding of this literature because it suggests that if people lose their job, you give them money to make up, that's not enough. They don't like it still. And happiness picks that up. And that's a really good thing um, for the happiness measures. The other thing from an economist perspective, and I suspect none of you are actually economists, but if you've seen what economists do, they build models with something called utility in it all the time. And that has no content by and large. It's just a mathematical trick for getting on to the next stage. And wouldn't it be nice if we had something to actually put in that box? And maybe these measures asking people, you know, how their lives are going is a useful thing there. So that. The other thing is for someone practical like me who spends, has spent a lot of their life collecting data once or another, these are really easy questions to ask. You try asking someone what their income is, right? And you're gonna spend the next hour explaining to them what income is and what the different parts of income are. And you'll get a mess in the end which you don't understand anyway, but we do it all the time. If you ask people how happy you are on a scale one to 10, boy, you get an answer almost immediately and you go on to the next question. So you get a lot of information for really very little. Um, the last positive thing, I'm sure there are more, but these are the ones I first thought of is, they sort of directly address mental health issues and mental health is something that's been ignored maybe too much. And so if one of the things they might mean is just how is your mental health, okay. So let me finish with a quick point of disagreement, all right? So some people think that happiness is all that matters and, you know, everything else should be judged by how happy it makes you. And what's more, a second step, that, that happiness is well enough measured by asking people on a scale of zero to 10 how well you are. I think that's absurd, um, but there are serious people who think that's what you ought to do. And nothing. So if there's a thing that makes you um, happy, then it's a good thing. If it doesn't make you happy, it doesn't matter. So that, that's the attitude that I don't agree with here. Now, one of the reasons for not believing in that is something that really comes very clearly from the writings of Amartya Sen. Um, and that is that people sometimes can use happiness as an adaptation strategy. So even if people are being really abused, 
and are seriously deprived, they might say they're happy or they might actually be happy because they think that's the best they can do with their lives. So this is very much into the sort of oppression of women, for instance, in societies where women um, don't have full rights. Um, women might adapt that social standard to the point they say, yes, I'm very happy, but there's lots of things I'm not allowed to do. And that to some is, you know, just because people are happy with it doesn't mean that we shouldn't have to do something about it. So, and, I, and that I think is one of the biggest criticisms of the happiness literature. There are also some pretty odd findings and the question is what do you do with those? So, you know, I've done some work in the US that shows that black people in the US are pretty much as happy, sometimes much happier than white people. I just don't believe that, or if I do believe it, I don't think it means we don't have to worry about <laughs> the standing of black people versus white people in the US. So that's an example. And that means that even if we collect happiness data, we really need to know about these other things too, about material deprivation and what's happening to people. So that's my little blurb. A very thought provoking blurb. Please join me in welcoming our last panel onto stage. So our moderator is Joanne Jung, who is the, the founder of Research for Impact. We have Xiao Yin Quick, who is the executive director of Common Ground. Xia En Yo, who is founder of Happiness Scientists. Two young scientists who joined the discussion with Angus. We have Emma Go Sin Ni, who is a psychology student from National University of Singapore, and Claudine Enduma, who is an urban planning student from the University of the Philippines, and Anna de Adio, you've already met. And it's been pointed out to me by Joanne that we have an all-female panel, um, <laughs> which she rightly criticised, and I have to say that we're so obsessed with not making all-male panels, we forgot mm -hmm. to notice that we had an all-female panel. <laughs> so, sorry, Joanne. But you have male students on the video, so enjoy. Thank you very much, and thank you all for being here. What a war of attrition. I think one of the great rules of pursuing happiness is not to be the last panel on the end of a very long day. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, in line with the theme of this panel, I intend to have a wonderful time here on the stage with a terrific panel and to really try to wrap up some of the many, many themes we've heard today together with, I think, the very thought-provoking comments uh, from Professor Deaton. What I think is actually really fascinating about happiness is how difficult it is for us to put a definition on it or actually to measure it. And I think Angus has spoken in great detail about how we try to do this in a research setting. Um, one of the things I think which is really interesting is as a parent, um, we know that when we try to measure happiness, not just on a one to 10 scale, it's very difficult. So when we do something called ecological momentary assessment, which means we call people at random times and ask them how they're doing like your mother. And we ask parents how they do, and we measure how happy they are in that moment on a scale of one to 10. And what we find is that when we measure the happiness of people this way, parents are the most unhappy people in the world. <laughs> But then when we ask separately in other surveys for people to reflect back on what makes them the happiest in the world, it turns out that parents are actually simultaneously also the happiest people in the world. And that we derive great joy and personal satisfaction from this experience, which basically consists of young people jumping up and down on you every day. And these are not contradictory because, uh, as just to reference another Nobel laureate, I was very happy to see behavioral scientists uh, today what we know is that happiness is a very fluid and relative concept to the extent that we're able to measure it. It varies across context, it varies across setting, and it varies within ourselves. So if we look at the work of Daniel Kahneman, he talks about two things, the experiencing self and the remembering self. And the experiencing self is the self that is at the bottom of your storeroom looking for the mid-autumn festival lantern that your son threw away last year and needs now. And the remembering self, which is the self that at the end of the day internalizes these memories and acts on them and takes them into the future, is the self that looks back on it and says, ah, the days are short, but the years are long. And so how we experience happiness, even within ourselves, changes. And I think 
hopefully in this discussion today, we'll have a little bit of thought about how everything that we've heard today feeds into our ideas of happiness in the present, happiness in the future, what drives it, whether or not this is something that we should value for its own sake, and how we place it in a broader context. And so I'd like actually to turn um, actually to the reason that we are here, and really start by asking our panelists what they took from today, what struck them the most, and for our, I think our student panelists, who again are the reason why we are here, to ask them what their burning questions are. After a whole day, I think, of incredible content, what actually struck you the most? But also, what led you to question the most? And maybe we can start in the corner. Emma? Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here. And actually, from the previous pre-recorded discussion, um, and basically, this whole idea of pursuing happiness struck me the most. Okay, it's kind of ambiguous, so like I'm going to explain what I mean by the whole topic itself struck me the most. Because when we are talking about the pursuit of happiness, right, it's like we are talking about happiness as an end that we need to find means to. Which is why I feel that shouldn't really be the case because like happiness is just like any emotions, right? It's something that we experience from day to day. And if we actually look inwards and um, sort of like be in touch with our emotions more, we can actually find happiness in the small things that we experience in everyday life, right? But that aside, I find that the pursuit of happiness is like a journey, right? So if we are likening, likening it to be a journey, then we need to know what our own destination is. Because the destination for every single person, every one of us here, is very different, right? So similarly, like happiness to everyone is very different. And um, I think that we first need to know what our own happiness is. Because like a toy to a child like can bring him happiness, but a toy to me may not bring me happiness. Yeah. So something along the lines of defining our own happiness is what um, I picked up during the pre-recorded discussion. And actually, my burning question is, um, should we ever quantify happiness? And how can we quantify happiness? Like pre from the previous panel discussions, I think we, there was um, some talks about um, having like a happiness index or like a satisfaction index to indicate success. But can we really do it? And should we really do it? Yeah, these are my questions. Thank you. That's a terrific and difficult question, and I'm going to punt on it and move it over to Shan. And Shan, maybe if you could say a little bit about what you do and how that relates to this question, that would be great. Okay, so hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Shan, and I, I guess in a nutshell, you could call me a happiness scientist. Uh, I went to the uh, University of Pennsylvania to study positive psychology, which in a nutshell is the science of happiness. So um, I think it's a really interesting question that Emma has raised in terms of uh, quantifying and measurement. And I guess we could look at it two ways. One is in a very subjective way, as in how do I as a person in this present moment feel? And as mentioned by Angus, sometimes we use very simple scales of a zero to 10. Uh, and maybe that seems a little simplistic, but if you look at it from the subjective term, in that present moment, perhaps that is the most important thing. But we could also look at it on objective terms, and that's where things like the happiness index comes from and so many other surveys that have tried to quantify happiness. So I think, I think when we think about this concept of happiness, I also want to broaden the discussion to the main topic of today on well-being. Happiness is defined by Brené Brown as a pleasurable state in response to an external environment. And that, as Angus has mentioned, is not all-encompassing. But if we look at well-being, then perhaps we could think of things like happiness being a positive emotion. We also derive well-being from engagement in the things that we are doing. A community, as was mentioned in the earlier panel, also brings us closer to that feeling that we get of, of well-being. And how about accomplishments and also things like meaning? I think in this generation, as I've had many conversations with them, um, they tend to talk a lot about belonging, mattering, and meaning. Yeah, I think that's amazing, I think, to bring that back to the broader theme, right? Which is where we're thinking really about all of these different determinants of well-being and how they play into this and how happiness is a strong signal, but not a complete and sufficient statistic for us to understand. And again, I mean, I think given the wealth of what we've talked about today, like nothing, I think, is going to be a sufficient <laughs> metric for us to encompass this discussion. But it's a useful, but perhaps not the only mm. thing that we need to respond to. And perhaps I'll ask Claude. Claude, what are your thoughts? Okay. 
So, um, hello everyone. I'm Claudine from the Philippines. I'm studying urban planning. I'm taking my master's in urban planning. And during the uh, pre-recorded discussion and even um, uh, during the discussion earlier, I think uh, while we are talking about happiness and well-being, uh, one, one concept that was really brought about is um, the, concept, the mental health issues that we have right now. And uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, really an um, issue that we have. Uh, actually, we thought of it like a puzzle during the discussion because it's really uh, a, buzz a puzzling concept right now. And I think it's really an issue that we should talk about. And for me, my my concept of happiness is, as I said by Emma earlier, it's really connecting as well within, uh, connecting with the purpose that you may have as. Uh, the Nobel laureates or have their advocacies. So maybe that's also like a concept, their concept of happiness, our connection with our emotions. Like we don't just block. And actually one, one, one uh, thing that we are also thinking earlier when during our conversations, we're all female, but you know, there's also like mental health issues like for men. I mean, they, they, they have um, access to, um, good uh, job most most people have most uh, people we have that issues in inequality in gender inequality in terms of income right but then in terms of mental health um there's also rising number in terms of suicide in men so it's 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 one thing connecting within and then connecting with your community connecting with uh the community you're in this, that sense of belongingness as uh you did said um so it's it's really that though I think those two concepts, those are the concepts that I think is uh, happiness for me. And as an urban planning, uh, urban planner, um, as aspiring urban planner, my uh, question is, uh, despite there are communities that are successful, there are personalities that are successful, uh, and yet they still have this mental health issues and they seem maybe they're not happy. Um, how do we create a community in the future or now that uh, you know that supports uh, this uh, this individuals their well-being um, while having those infrastructures um, income source of income and this item. so how can we create a community that would you know a community of happiness a community where people are happy. That's, that's my question. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. And I'd like to actually turn this back to Xiaoyin, who's done so much work here, both as a nominated member of parliament, but also in your work at Common Ground to build community, to work with organizational and individual development, and to really sort of think about how we do this on the ground here in Singapore. So could I pass this to you? Um, and the question was again? Um, how, how do we build a community that ensures the well-being ha and happiness mm -hmm. of the people living in it? Thank you. Okay. Um, I think the first thing that struck me is the title of like this panel, which is the pursuit of happiness, <laughs> which I think is a fool's pursuit, to be very frank. Happiness is like any other emotion. It's fleeting. And mm -hmm. if you try to pursue something that's fleeting, you're going to be really, really unhappy. <laughs> right? So, and, and it also begs the point, why not the pursuit of anger? Why not the pursuit of sadness? Are these emotions inferior to happiness? And I think well-being really is about giving ourselves the permission to feel the things that we need to feel. Happiness, sadness, anger, all these are all valid emotions to feel in reaction to the good things and the bad things that happen to us. So I think it's a misnomer to say like, oh, society needs to be happy. Happiness is important, but it is not the thing to pursue. So for me, the answer to well-being, which I see as separate to happiness, is the answer obviously is not in abundance because the most abundant buying-centric economies are also the ones with people with the greatest amount of discontent, mm -hmm. right? It, it doesn't make any sense when you think about it. But the answer is there. They have pursued happiness, they got it, and they are still not happy. Which means the answer to all of this is satisfaction, which I really love that economic well-being panel, they brought it up, right? The answer to the scarcities that you will feel in this world is satisfaction. And satisfaction is not about like, all right, fine, let me just like be happy with whatever I have. 
Satisfaction is only found when you pursue meaning. It's the pursuit of meaning, and along the way, you discover happiness. And you also discover sadness, and you also discover anger. But the pursuit of meaning, meaning is not fleeting. Meaning is something that can be pursued and should be pursued. And if we pursued meaning more, we wouldn't see half the problems that we talked about today, right? All of the problems have come about today is because we've tried to pursue happiness. We need a car, we need a hotel, we need a whatever, right? Once we have all those things, our country will be happy, but it's not. We have forgotten to pursue meaning and purpose and values, and those are the things that will make us well. And I think that's very. I think that's a very uh, vital message for all of us as we think about sort of economic prosperity and what it really means to thrive. Right when we see community and values, not just in ourselves but also in other people. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that at, you know, as you said, pursuing happiness in and of itself to the exclusion of everything else is not a rich life in another sense of, of richness. But on the other hand, I want to come back to something that uh, that Prof. Deaton actually brought up as well, which is that regardless of, of who we are or where we are, in order for us to pursue meaning or value, right, uh, we want to think about all of these other things that lift up the communities and systems that we're in. And we want to think about things that are, again, and unfortunately, I am an economist. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so nobody likes me. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard for me to go through life with this cross, right? But it does mean that we have to think about the systems that we live in in order for ourselves to pursue these higher order goals, to have the education, to think about what it means to find value, and again, to build all of these different things that do not seem very glamorous on a level of it, but allow us to have that mental space and cognitive bandwidth to think higher, better thoughts. Mm -hmm. So I want to come back to Anna and ask Anna at the end of this day, where I think so many, so many strands of so many panels are coming back to what you have presented around the SDGs and the mm -hmm. basic needs that we have that will enable us to go to another level. What has struck you the most in terms of calls to action or how we should be moving ahead? Thanks a lot. I'm very happy to be in this panel that I think it's really concluding the discussion we have had the, the entire afternoon and morning. Um, just to answer in a way that um, for me it's very important here, the title of this event is really the future we want together. Mm -hmm. So why we want this future together? We want this, this future together not to be happy, I think, not just to be happy, say. Um, we want to be, we want the, the future we want together is the future that gives the best opportunities to everyone and gives the potential to everyone to express himself or herself. We talk about the rights of people, we talk about uh, the rights of children, we talk about mm -hmm. digitalization, climate change, uh, health uh, and uh, education and many other things. And all these things are really important to the well-being of a society. So that's why I quite agree on the fact that happiness is a different concept. Um, happiness is a uh, mirror some emotion, as it was already said. Well-being is something that, as it was already said in, uh, in the afternoon, is something more complex, is something multidimensional. Taking into account some aspects that as economists we value, of course, like uh, um, uh, aspects that are really material, I would say, income, uh, wealth, uh, consumption, but many others that cannot be captured mm -hmm. by a material perspective. So civic engagement, uh, the fact of uh, social interconnect interconnections, uh, um, of course, health, uh, mm -hmm. but many others. So what I take from what has struck me today is um, the, the amount of, uh, of brain, I would say, <laughs> that uh, and uh, the amount of uh, enthusiasm that is here and uh, really something that celebrates um, the kind of uh, um, purpose of this event. The fact that young people are here and are active and they are really interested in all these issues and they want to go 
uh, I had. It's really something that is beautiful. And, uh, and that's why we have to think about investing in education. We have to think about investing in human capital, in social capital, in economic capital, in cultural capital. If there is something that may be affected by cultural norms and ca is happiness, that's why it's very relative, very fluctuating. There is something that is much more, uh, is much more important to focus on, is how to make our society um, better for everyone, how to improve well-being of everyone. And mm -hmm. I think this is the point. And this is really what struck, not really struck, but because I believe that this can happen. And, but it's really something that came out from the optimism. There is, of course, always a, um, a, a moment of pessimism because we can say, we are in front of huge challenges, mm -hmm. uh, conflicts, extreme weather events, uh, uh, many poverty, disasters of every time. Mm -hmm. But there is a lot of hope that is here, and this hope really contribute to make our societies better. I think that's amazing, and I, and I very much sort of enjoy pointing this back to the young people in our audience. We are facing unprecedented challenges. We've never been here before on the brink of such climate change, on the brink of so much political crisis, on the brink of so much self-realization. And ironically, we are also sort of the most self-aware and data-rich yes. time you know, of the world. But at the same time, we have hope. And that's, I think, really amazing. So I think we've talked a lot about glasses half full and glasses half empty. The benefit of being an economist is that we understand that scarcity is the fundamental condition of human life. And then we get over it and continue listening to the terrible lecture. <laughs> but we also realize that with, with scarcity comes choice. And with choice, yes. right, our ability to think about choice is what makes us human, which is amazing. I want actually to move, I know we, are, we don't have a lot of time for this panel, so I want to actually move on to my second sort of major question for this panel, which is where do we go from here in building our capacity for hope? And with that, I'd actually like to allow for, I did quite a lot of, of work with, uh, with Adam to try to get some male representation on the panel. So if we could please play uh, the video from Hansel, who will, I think, set the stage for us to go into the next question. Singapore, it's really clear that our so-called natural resources like our people, yet we're currently facing a problem where our citizens are no longer wanting to reproduce. In fact, in Singapore, the birth rate has fallen because of an increase um, in the proportion of highly educated Singaporeans who tend to have fewer children. And with each passing year, the birth rates are declining by approximately 1% with each year in the past few years. So as a youth who is you know, ab so absorbed in my own academic career, while also trying to make ends meet, it, it gets really overwhelming. And our education, our education system is pretty well known globally for being successful. Yet there's been cases of, you know, young children at the age of 12 years old taking their own life because of the pressure that they're under academically. So these are just some of my thoughts, you know, with my situation and my observation as a Singaporean. So maybe posing this to Professor Deaton, I'd love to hear your thoughts about, you know, this problem of a successful society such that people are so career driven to the extent that we're forgetting to enjoy life, spread positivity and <laughs> even repopulate. So <laughs> it makes myself question how successful we really are considering how subjective it is. Educated women are one of the great benefits of educating women around the world is to give them autonomy um, and allow them to pursue what they really want to pursue, whether it's having children or not. And uh, higher educated women around the world have lower fertility. And that's always seemed like a good thing. So I think at the end of the day, we want to say we've built up an incredible, and we've seen many incredible young people here, but we've also laid a lot on your shoulders, young people. Uh, for which I'm very sorry. I realize I am a no longer a young person, which is very tragic. But again, at the same time, I think having this self-awareness is incredible. And having this incredible panel, I think, here of educated women, I'd like to ask all of you guys, as we think about, I think, these incredible cohort of youth, but also these unprecedented challenges that we're facing in a world of incredible prosperity, but also incredible need, what do you think we can do 
to build up the capacity to be happy in our young people? How can we build the resilience that we need to stay positive, to keep that hope going, and to be resilient as we move forward? And I'm going to actually start here from Xiaoyin. I'm 45 now. I'm Gen X. Okay, I represent Gen X. And I got into cultural change work when I was 25. And I can tell you what attracted me into the work because I saw a problem that young people, whether they were the high grade scoring or the low grade scoring, they had two outcomes, at least in our system, that I felt were unacceptable. They came out unsure about who they were. And because they were unsure of who they were, they were indifferent to what was going on. So if we want things to change, I think what every young person can first do is to come into contact with your own adequacy. That there are values and meaningful things and good questions that you have inside you that is the change that we need to see in this system. And to not allow adults who don't know any better to guess like you into thinking that your values are not important. So that's the first. Get in touch with your own sense of inner adequacy and consider whether your questions are the questions that we should be asking ourselves. And then because of that, then you start paying attention to the world. There are things we cannot be indifferent about anymore. Adequacy leads to caring for the world. But if you feel you're inadequate, you would never question anything that's going on. And we do need to question so that we can take action. And if you do that, I promise you, you may not always be happy, but you will be satisfied. Amazing. Shan? I will sigh like Xiaoyin as well. <laughs> <laughs> My journey to sitting here started off with being an educator. And I guess I landed up in the business of happiness because I had seen far too many students who um, were struggling. Um, despite getting good grades. And I think some part of it starts with the micro by being the adults around them to ask different questions. And I think a common question that's still being asked to young people is, what do you want to be when you grow up? What kind of job do you want to have? And given the current climate and the, the next five or 10 years or whatever that looks like, I think we need to change the question. We can ask questions such as, what do you most want to contribute? What strengths do you have within you that you value? Because these questions prompt introspection and that will make them stop and think about, hey, who am I in this world? What do I matter? Do I matter? In fact, many young people as I speak to don't feel that they matter. And like Xiaoyin says, if they don't feel that they matter, how do we galvanize the energy that is hopeful within them to then be able to take the next stage. So that's one part of it. And I think um, one part of it is also looking, at, I think we've learned today that everything is so interconnected. Mm. Um, so, and if you say only do one part of it, but don't do the rest, then we probably won't come to a solution that's going to be mm. amenable to everybody. Um, but at the same time, we've got to start somewhere. So I think we can look at it at short term, something that can be done immediately, that's accessible that people can start using. These could be skills or certain um, tools mm -hmm. that they can use to build up their capacity. But then we can also start thinking long term. I think one of the, my bugbears is sustainability. It's very easy to say, let's do this, but how are we going to sustain it? Yes. And that's where I think all the different pillars can come in to say, let's do this piece, let's do this piece, and let's make it sustainable. And by doing that, we create structures. And, and you know, it comes back to the initial discussion on why have a framework? for well-being because frameworks create structure. Mm. And we don't have to use that structure so rigidly that it constrains us, but at least we have an idea of where we're heading. Yeah. yeah, I really love this idea of a compass. One of the things about economists is that we are, one of the great myths of economics is that more choice is always better. <laughs> and what we know now from behavioral economics is that that's not true. Choice is a burden. And sometimes actually living in a world of infinite possibility mm -hmm. actually leads to dissatisfaction and it can make us very unhappy. So part of, I think, of what being a talented young person out there with all of these things to do with your life, which is very frustrating, is that when people like myself or, or all of us say, you can do anything you want. <laughs> you can be anyone you want to be. It's very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> it's very annoying and it's stressful. But I think having a compass 
mm. and having a compass in other people and a sense of purpose about what you want to contribute mm. is a great first place to start. Mm -hmm. Anna? Yeah, um, I mean, the, the one uh, important thing is that each of us is unique. Mm? And uh, very often we see in many education system that this uniqueness is not fulfilled or even satisfied. So we talked in the previous panel, but also in other places during the day about what should education system uh, prepare, do uh, for people, uh, what, uh, what are meant for. And I think this is uh, the question, how to make uh, young people and uh, people uh, to court, uh, really uh, build trust and confidence in their capabilities, in their competencies, in their skills. And uh, this means not just are the skills, not just numeracy, literacy, but many other soft skills that mm. matters, critical thinking, the way they are social emotional learning, mm. the fact that there are these huge challenges uh, in the world require a lot from each of us, mm -hmm. a lot that goes beyond uh, education in uh, a traditional way. And this means that uh, schools are fundamental, but this is not just schools, is again uh, every one of us that can contribute. And something that is really important for the discussion we are having uh, is about uh, this global solidarity, this mm -hmm. idea of working together to achieve something better for the future we want. Exactly, and I think harnessing all that is I think our greatest, our greatest next challenge. Perhaps I'm gonna give the last word um, to our two young people for the day. Maybe we'll start with Claude. Okay, so um, actually I totally agree with all the concepts about uh, looking from within your unique identity. I would say, I would talk about maybe for the sense of community like uh, one of the few concepts that I remember in economics is like have, <laughs> having cool, <laughs> cool headed while having warm hearted. Um, mm. It's an approach in economic, I, economics. And maybe while we are uh, educating the young people, we are uh, promoting a uh, good quality education. It's also a good thing to uh, exercise, like develop a community that's full of compassion that you know they, that will make them resilient and would embrace them in terms of their differences mm -hmm. in terms of their uniqueness in terms of their race their um gender mm -hmm. as well as their well-being um uh, i think those are the things that I, I i really um learned from the discussions that um every aspect it's it's connected mm -hmm. and uh, we are, we, everyone has an influence to create that resilient community that would embrace the young so that they would not be afraid to talk, to express themselves, mm -hmm. yes. to express what, their, what the challenges they have. Because mm -hmm. as you've said, we have unprecedented challenges that we have to address. And we, we can, uh, I, I do believe that we can um, address those together with the youth. That's why I'm also very much honored that I'm part of this discussion because I feel like I'm being heard. I'm sure the young people here, they have their questions and it's really amazing for me to be given this opportunity to somehow um, share my thoughts. And one, one last thing that I would like to share is that while we have, we have built walls, digital divide, economics divide, um, I do still dream, I'm still uh, optimist to have that, you know, why don't we look at uh, have people having different races, but really just one race, the human race, and from there collaborate and uh, ha have that pursuit of happiness while, while on our journey. Perfect. Yeah. And Emma? Um, thank you um, to the previous um, panelists for sharing about how happiness is about meaning. And thank you, Claude, for sharing about the aspect about um, having a community. So maybe I'll talk about something that's a bit more individualized. So for myself, I'm quite a simple person and I believe that happiness can be simple if we just look around, right? And um, if we look inwards, right? So in this very volatile world, what we can do to sort of like pursue our own happiness is to perhaps maybe locate something that can be constant right because like our achievements can be very fleeting our our roles in something that gives us meaning 
can be also be very temporary. So what is one thing that um, gives you a permanent sense of meaning? For me, I locate that um, within my family. So I would think that um, I prioritize being a good daughter, even though I'm not the best, but because I've identified for myself that I love spending time with my loved ones, my family members, and this is what brings me the greatest happiness. And this is a constant role that I've identified for myself in my entire lifetime. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I believe happiness can be very simple and it can be constant if you identify one for yourself. And actually, I would just like to um, bring in one last point, which is um, what psychologists um, Carol Dweck espoused in um, Growth Mindset. So I like what um, the panelists have shared about like um, overcoming challenges and being resilient. I, I think that um, if our education institutions and if our family, um, we can um, cultivate a culture of having growth mindset, which is um, to not let our um, setbacks or failures define how good we are, but rather to challenge our boundaries and capacities in achieving greater things. I think that can help us navigate this volatile world and pursue happiness. Thank you. Yeah. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. So keeping an eye very firmly on the future. Mm -hmm. And keeping it simple, I think, in a complex world, what a great way to end this panel. Thank you all so much for your observations. I really had a great time. Um, so I, had, I fulfilled my own obligation of, of having a good time on this panel. Thank you all very much. I know it's been a long day. Thank you for staying here with us. And I'm going to pass this back to Adam. Adam Smith, actually. Hurrah, economics. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, John. And please stay seated because we're just going to say goodbye to everybody. And you preempted me because, yes, we've, the, the, the afternoon began with thanks to, the, to NUS and to the Nobel Prize Outreach for putting it together. And, to all the, and we've thanked all the panelists and we've thanked all the moderators and, it's been, and all the young people who took part in the discussions. And that's all been wonderful. But you're absolutely right that these dialogues wouldn't be anything without the audience. And uh, you mentioned choice on the panel, and you all had a choice whether to spend the afternoon with us or do something else. And we're very glad you chose to be with us. And I'd like to pay tribute to you all for sticking with this very long session. So thank you. <laughs> and that's it for this afternoon's Nobel Prize Dialogue. Um, those of you who are coming to the evening session, uh, please come back at about 6.15 and they're serving canapé before that starts. Uh, but uh, it just remains for me to say thank you and goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>